Good afternoon and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar on the implications and impacts of CBAM on South Africa and the continent. And I hope this webinar is a wake up call to business and industry. My name is Chris Yelland and I'm the Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence. And I will be your host at this webinar signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome to all our presenters who will be introduced to you in due course. I'm going to be sharing now a link with you on the Zoom chat facility where you can download the presenter biographies. So please do look out on the chat uh, text chat facility on Zoom and you will see the link where you can click on and download uh, these um, uh, biographies. So a big welcome to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation. Uh, this webinar is hosted by EE Business Intelligence. I would like to acknowledge and thank the delegation of the European Union to the Republic of South Africa. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Department of Trade and Industry and Competition, the DTIC, and the Presidential Climate Commission, the PCC, and Trade, Industrial, trade and Industrial Policy Strategies tips as well as the Energy Intensive User Group and Huleman for their most valued support and participation in this webinar and for the great work they do in this field. We have about 1,300 delegates registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say on the subject. This is an incredible response to what some may consider to be quite an obscure and technical topic on trade and industrial policy. And I think the great turnout attests to the relevance of the subject matter that has been covered today, as well as the stature of the presenters themselves. So may I express a big thanks to all the presenters for their participation and for the time and effort that they have put in. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend, as well as publicly. So tomorrow you may expect a uh, feedback report from us uh, with these links to view the webinar and download the presentations. Colleagues, a Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or CBAM, is a levy on carbon intensive goods imported into specific regions like the European Union and other regions to fight so-called carbon leakage. Now, carbon leakage occurs when companies transfer production to places where decarbonization requirements are less strict or where products are replaced by more carbon intensive imports from these places. As an exporting country, South Africa will fail due to this carbon border adjustment, making several major South African exports less competitive in the European Union and other domains compared to products using less carbon intensive methods and materials. On the other hand, a CBAM could also create incentives for South African producers to reduce their carbon footprint, which could ultimately benefit South Africa and the environment. CBAM currently covers cement, aluminium, fertilizer, electricity, hydrogen, iron and steel, iron ore, and a number of downstream products. In South Africa, there is an immediate risk to exports amounting to some 52.4 billion rands based on 2022 data. And this risk is expected to grow as CBAM expands its coverage. The European Commission adopted an implementation uh, regulation on the 13th of July, 2023, and entered into a transitional phase on the 1st of October, 2023, that's last year, which requires importers to report emissions embedded in the CBAM project products that they import. And during this transitional period, no financial obligation is due. The definitive CBAM will then start in 2026 with a gradual phase-in to be fully operational by 2034. The South African government has called the European, European Union CBAM as being policy coercive and a threat to a delicate national consensus as it imposes additional costs that could negatively impact the South African economy, labor, businesses, 
and their competitiveness in the European Union market. So this webinar is intended to be a wake-up call to business, industry, and labor in South Africa, as it explores the implications and impacts of CBAM on South Africa, the region, and the continent. Uh, colleagues, the program for the day has been widely circulated, but a link will now be shared with you on the uh, Zoom uh, text chat facility to download the problem. And this is going to now be shared uh, by Ian, our producer, on the Zoom chat facility. So please do take a look at that and feel free to uh, click on it and, and download the program for the day. We also now have five expert presenters who will each give 20-minute presentations. This will be followed by a 30-minute open discussion and Q&A session, and then thanks and closure by myself. While the presentation is in progress, please do send us your questions on the Zoom Q&A text facility and not on the chat facility. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally. And we've set aside about 30 minutes after the presentations for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. So without further ado, I would like to now call on our first presenter, who is Bethente Roa. And he is signed in from Brussels to give us a presentation, uh, giving us further details from the European Union's perspective. So uh, may I introduce Vicente, who is the head of the unit in the European Commission responsible for the CBAM and the energy taxation, uh, two of the flag initiatives of the European Union Green Deal. His first steps in the Directorate General for Taxation started in 2006, when he was responsible for drafting the review of the Savings Directive before becoming the assistant to two previous Director Generals responsible for customs and taxation. His experience in the European Commission also covers seven years in the Secretary General, working first on the European uh, semester and then in the relations with the European Council. Previously to joining the European Commission, Vicente had been a tax consultant in the Jarige Abrogadas for 10 years. Hope I got those, present, those pronunciations right. Mm -hmm. And he has got expertise, uh, significant expertise in international taxation. So it's a great pleasure now to hand over to Bethente and ask him to deliver his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for the presentation. And your pronunciation in Spanish is quite good, so no, no worries about mm -hmm. that. I would also like to thank EEA Business Intelligence and, of course, all the co-sponsors, as you, as you referred to, because this is for us a great opportunity, of course, to, to reach out to a big audience. I can see that there is already a lot of interest in, in knowing more about, about the CBAM. And although you already you, I think you said the, the main issues about the CBAM, I hope that during my 20 minutes, uh, there is a risk that I may take longer. I, I will try to, to drive you through the, the details of the, of the CBAM. I will not be presenting uh, specific issues like, for example, the methodology to report, to monitor, and to report the emissions. I think that would need another additional hour. But of course, that's something that in the future I think we can we have to do with the operators and exporters of the seaman goods in South Africa. My my objective today is, as you said before, to show and present the CBAM to get to get familiar with the mechanism. I think that the more you know it, the more you understand it. And I think that's something important. And we are doing an effort in order to, to be able to explain as, as, as much as we can and as better or as best as we can to, to everyone around the world. And also, as you mentioned, uh, and I think that's important, how to turn the fear for the CBAM into an opportunity or into an incentive to decarbonize. As you will see through my presentation, and I will insist on that uh, quite quite a lot, the CBAM is not targeting any specific country in the world. It's targeting country, a company, sorry, not countries. And we, we want to take into account and we understand that uh, companies in different countries are doing more or less efforts in terms of decarbonization. And what we want to do also through the CBAM is to pay back to those companies which are doing um, uh, an investment in green technologies. In the end, as you will see also this afternoon, the main objective of the CBAN, of course, is to contribute to the decarbonization in the EU. And I will explain in detail how, 
but also around the world, because I think that the problem, of course, of pollution and more in particular, the, the fight against uh, climate change is a concern that uh, is important for, for all of us. Uh, on the next slide, I try to present the, the main uh, objectives or the main uh, reasons why we have decided to introduce a CBAM. Uh, as Chris said before, the CBAM started already in October last year during a transitional period. The definitive regime with financial obligations will only kick in in 2026, so we're still time. And as I will explain later on, this time uh, has to be used in order to better understand the mechanism and also in order to get prepared. And I think that that's, of course, what you want to hear today, how to get prepared uh, to, to comply with, with the CBAM and also to mitigate the impact the impacts of the CBAM. As you know, in the European Union, we have a carbon price, which is the emission trading system. I would refer to it as the EU ETS, which has been in place for many years, uh, something like uh, for the last um, 15, 16 years. It has worked well in order to reduce emissions in the EU. Actually, the European Union has already announced uh, the carbon neutrality target by 2050, we were one of the first or the first around the world to announce the carbon neutrality in 2050. And also our targets to reduce emissions are really very ambitious. They were just uh, reinforced or enhanced uh, recently for 2030 with a 55% reduction of emissions. And now we also have plans to reduce even further by 2040 to reach a reduction of 90%, 90 percent, nine zero percent of the greenhouse gases emissions compared with the previous levels. I think that's a really very ambitious agenda, and I think the European Union uh, is showing the way, the path, and also taking its contribution and its uh, responsibility when it comes, of course, to, to reduce greenhouse gases emissions. So basically, the CBAM comes to reinforce the application of the EU ETS, because as I will explain later on more in detail, uh, also in the EU ETS, some of the companies receive some of the allowances free. The EU ETS, it's a cap and trade system. We set the cap of the emissions every year, and then there is a market, first an auctioning market, but also a secondary market where the companies can buy those certificates to comply with their obligations in terms of emissions. The CBAM will work in a similar way. First, it will apply the same rules like in the EU to the imported goods, to a number of imported goods, not all goods. Uh, that's important to, to know that we are talking about a limited number of sectors. And I will, the sectors were mentioned before by, by Chris. Uh, but those sectors are those which are more, more intensive and in, in emissions. And the idea, of course, is that for those sectors in the European Union, which have to decarbonize quicker, there will be a phase out of those free allowances in the EU ETS much, much faster because those sectors will be in the CBAM and we will apply the same rules to those goods imported into the EU as if they would have been produced in the EU. So the idea basically, and that's what the literature says, preventing the risk of carbon leakage, but the idea basically is to say, we want to put pressure on the EU industry to decarbonize and to achieve the target, but at the same time, we want to be fair and we want to make sure that goods which are sold on the EU territory apply the same rules irrespective of where they produce. So this is a question of fairness. On the next slide, I explain how we are going to do that. So first of all, we will introduce a measure which is mirroring the EU ETS. So there will be some sort of obligations from 2026 to buy CBAN certificates according to the embedded emissions in the imported goods and the obligations will fall on the importers in the EU. So that's good and important to know. The obligations to comply with the CBAM fall on the importer. Of course, there will be an important and relevant uh, task or, or charge for exporters to the EU because you know your emissions, you can monitor your emissions, and there will be some verification of those emissions from 2026. But the main obligations in the EU fall on the importers. We don't set a cap and trade system as the ETS. Why? Because we cannot cap the emissions. If we cap the emissions for imported goods, that would be something similar to say that we are also limiting the number of importations into the EU. And that's not what we want to do with the measure. That, that has to be very clear. We want to contribute to the trade. We want to contribute to continuing 
importing goods from third countries. But of course, what we want to do is to make sure that those goods are as clean as possible and that are as low in embedded emissions as, as possible. And this is why the CBAM, and I come back to my first point about a measure addressing at companies, will take into account, of course, the embedded emissions in the production of those goods and will reward those clean producers with respect to the less clean producers. The carbon price that we will apply will be the same. Uh, in the EU ETS, there is a weekly auctioning where EU producers can buy the ETS certificates and the price fluctuates. I can tell you that now we have a price around 80 euros per ton of CO2 emitted. And then what we want to do is to do something similar. We, we, we will not have an auctioning for, for the CBAM because it will not be a purely cap and trade system. But importers will have to buy those certificates whenever they want to buy. So they will be free to decide the moment when to, they want to buy along the year. But the price will be the same. So there will be a weekly price that will be applied to the, to the CBAM certificates. Uh, as I said before, they will be based or the system will be based on the actual carbon content of the imported goods. In those cases where monitoring is difficult, impossible, or where there has not been any verification of those emissions by the independent third party, in that case, uh, the importers will be able to rely on default values. So some sort of average carbon intensity per country and per good that the commission will be publishing by the end of next year. We already published some default values for the transitional period. I will explain a bit later how the transitional period is working. But these are world averages, not country averages. And this will be, of course, uh, fine-tuned uh, and adapted to the specific case of every country by the end of the transitional period. That also gives a big incentive, of course, into to, uh, countries around the world to decarbonize their industry, because if they also reduce the carbon average or the average carbon intensity of their producers, they will also be uh, benefiting from uh, lower default values. Uh, finally, of course, if you have a carbon price, and that's the case of South Africa, where you have a carbon tax, uh, then that carbon price, if effectively, I mean, effective, of course, carbon price, because I know that, for example, in your carbon tax, you have some sort of exemptions or reductions. So it has to be the effective carbon price paid by the company. That carbon price can be also deducted from the adjustment in order to avoid double, uh, double carbon price. As such, as you can see, there is also a big incentive. There is no obligation to introduce carbon pricing. That has to be clear. But it gives a strong incentive on governments around the world to introduce carbon pricing. And I can tell you that countries for example, Turkey, but also many other countries, like uh, could be Morocco, they are considering very seriously the introduction of carbon pricing in order first to reduce the impact of the CBAM. And that's fair enough because we didn't introduce the CBAM to collect the revenues. And that's important also to say, but also because they will be able to collect the revenues and to recycle those revenues to support the green transition. And we think this is a great idea. So if South Africa were to reinforce, enhance, increase its carbon tax, you have to say, or you have to know that that would of course be uh, benefiting also from the CBAM adjustment. On the next slide, very briefly, you can see the sectors. Those sectors are those who are very high intensive in carbon emissions. I can tell you that with the six sectors, we are covering more than 50% of the emissions produced in the EU in the, in the sectors which are in, in the scope of the ETS. And these are also sectors which are very intensive also in trade with the EU. Hydrogen and electricity may be a bit of a, an exception because it's true that we don't import hydrogen at this moment or the importations are very, very low, very marginal. And the same happens with electricity. But also maybe you know that the European Union has engaged in a strong uh, push for importation and, and, and for the, in general electrification and the use of the hydrogen and in particular green electricity and green hydrogen in the EU for the next years. And uh, I think it's important and what we want also to promote is the importation of green electricity and green hydrogen. So again, as I said before, we are not trying to curtail or reduce imports from third countries, although this is what we hear sometimes from third countries. To the contrary, what we want to do is to import greener products from third countries and to give an incentive to decarbonize 
and also why not to introduce carbon pricing. By the end of the transitional period, we will be reflecting on whether we extend the scope to other sectors. I can tell you that the European Parliament was very adamant to, to do that, but now we have elections this weekend, so we have to see what will be the result of the elections, as you had in South Africa two weeks ago. So now we need to take stock of what will be the new uh, the new positions of the parliament and also of member states with respect to the extension of the scope. So for the moment, nothing has been decided. In any case, and I want to be clear, we can only extend to sectors which are in the EU ETS. Agriculture is not in the EU ETS. So I think that some of the, of the people in the audience will be relieved for, from hearing this. And also we need, uh, and we only consider, of course, including sectors which are really at risk of carbon leakage. So high level carbon emissions and also a lot of trade with the, with the EU. On the next slide, you can see a bit the, the schedule or the timeline with the introduction of the CBAM. CBAM will be introduced very gradually. First, because from October, we only started with a transitional period. It's a period to learn for you, as exporters, for us, as importers, customs, officers, but also for us uh, as commission, because we want to learn from you. We want to understand how you monitor your emissions, how you report, how you verify your emissions, what are your levels of carbon intensity, what is your carbon price. I mean, we want to understand all these things. We also want to listen to you. Uh, we know that uh, introducing a new measure like the CBAM at the same time uh, keeps uh, some sort of administrative burden. And that's also why uh, we, we want to make sure that by the end of the transitional period, we are also able to simplify the process of the system as much as we can. And then by the end of 2025, we will take stock, we will report to the parliament and the council, and maybe based on that, we may amend also the system that will be in place from 2026. On the next slide, although very technical, but I want you to understand as well that from 2026, and until 2034, there will also be a gradual introduction of the CIPAM. I mentioned before that the EU ETS, many of the sectors, and in particular, most of the CIPAM sectors receive uh, free allowances. That means that many of those emissions, their emissions are free of carbon price. And for that reason, we will also recognize that, free, that level of free allowances or those free allowances to the imported goods. Uh, as you can see here on the graph, there is a phase out of the free allowances for those sectors from 26 to 2034. The phase out will be very gradual at the beginning with a small reductions of those free allowances. But then, of course, after 2030, there will be a, an accelerated phase out of the free allowances. That will have an impact on the CBAM, of course, on the imported goods. But at the same time, they will have an impact on the, on the production in the European Union. I can tell you very quickly, um, although that's very technical for those of you who don't know the ETS, that those benchmarks for free allowances correspond to the average of the 10% of the best producers in the EU, and that's calculated good by good. And I can tell you, for example, that in the case of the steel, 80% of the allowances or the uh, emissions are already covered by free, al free allowances. So just to give you an example, in 2026, if your if the benchmark in the EU for free allowances is one ton, we will have to reduce by 2.5%. That means slightly below one ton, the benchmark for the CBAM. If your carbon emission, for example, intensity of your steel in South Africa were 1.5, that means that the adjustment would be only on 0 0.5 or a bit less than 0 0.5%. Uh, tons of CO2 per ton of steel exported to the EU. So as you can see, gradual introduction with the transitional period, but also gradual introduction uh, during this period from 26 to 2034. On the next slide, if you're wondering what is the impact of the CBAM, and we hear very often, and I suppose this afternoon we will hear about the impact on the South African uh, producers, I can tell you that when you compare uh, with the rest of the world, uh, it's not South Africa, which comes as one of the most affected countries in terms of, of CBAM, because you are not one of the most uh, um, exporters or the biggest, largest exporters of the CBAM goods to the EU. My figures, I think Chris referred to figures in runs. I think I have the same figures. Our figures say that around 2 billion of euros I think it's uh, different in runs, of course, uh, are the CBAM goods which are exported to the EU. So these are the ones which will be impacted, but that's only a rough 
7% of all the exports from South Africa to the EU in 2022. That's for with figures from 2022. Iron, steel, and aluminium, of course, are the most impacted sectors or the most or the, or the goods which are you exporting more to the EU in terms of seaborne goods. And then, of course, far away fertilizers and also small quantities of, of cement. But again, when you look at the different countries, South Africa is not one of the most impacted countries, or I would say it's one of the least impacted countries. But of course, that doesn't mean that it's important that you we understand CBAN. And then, of course, we work together with you, with your government, in order to, to analyze the impact of CBAN and to see how we can help you with, uh, of course, with uh, the application of CBAN. On the next slide, two slides next. Very briefly on the transitional period, uh, as I said, it started in October. We are only collecting data. Uh, the importance of this data for us is to understand your systems, as I mentioned before, and also, but also for everyone to understand how CBAM works. So if you don't know anything about CBAM and you are exporting still to the EU, no worries. I mean, uh, well, I mean, hurry up, of course. Talk to your importers in the EU. Understand what they need from you uh, because you will need to share information with them about your goods, uh, which is important to comply with the, with the CBAM. But of course, all the obligations or financial obligations will only start in 2026. In order to take into account um, the administrative work or burden with implementation, on the next slide, we can see that we have set up a registry, um, what we call the CBAM Transitional Registry where importers, which are the declarants uh, in the EU, they have to submit their quarterly report with the data that they are collecting of the imported CBAN goods into, into the EU. And then we are, of course, checking that data with the customs authorities and also with the national competent authorities for the CBAM in the EU member states. I can tell you, although you are not concerned with that, that the importers in the EU, they have to register with the national competent authorities in the country where they are established. And they they, they have to comply with all the obligations through this uh, CBAN transitional registry. As you can see here on the slide, as operators of installations in third countries, what you need to do is to share the data about the carbon content of your goods and the carbon price that you have paid for those emissions with your reporting declarance in the EU. So basically with the importance of your goods in the, in the EU, but you don't have to comply with any other uh, obligations. On the next slide, we can see that in the transitional period, we have provided for some sort of um, reliefs or uh, reductions or simplifications. So it's important to say that um, you can also benefit from those and it's in the next slide where you can clearly see that, for example, you can use default values. You don't need to provide actual emissions until July, which will be the third reporting period that will correspond to the second quarter of 2024. But then from October, so corresponding to the third quarter of 2024, we expect to collect uh, actual emissions, so real values, not default values because we need this data in order to make a good analysis and, to, and in order to understand also your, your systems. There is a methodology which has been put in place and on our website, you can find a lot of information and I will give you the, the email, uh, I mean the web, the, the link to the website of, after at the end of the, of the presentation. Uh, but what is important to know is that from October, you, you need to share the, the actual emissions based on a methodology that we have put in place for the transitional period. We are also working on this methodology. We want to fine tune the methodology. We want to make it more streamlined, uh, understandable, uh, closer to the methodologies that you use in your countries to assess your emissions. And in particular, for example, in South Africa for, for your carbon tax. Uh, but that's something that, of course, we, we need to do during this time. And this is why we need to collect this data. If you are using another methodology for your own purposes in South Africa, you can still use also that methodology until the end of the year. So that's another another relief for you uh, in order to help you to, to, to get more time, to win time uh, in order to understand the, the methodology. I said that the default values cannot be used from 20, sorry, from October 2024. There is an exception, and this is when up to 20% of the total embedded emissions of complex of complex goods. In that case, you can use default values for those 
for those emissions, but you need to use the actual emissions for, for the rest of the, of the emissions. So now very quickly on the definitive regime, uh, on the next slide. Next. I already mentioned that before, from 2026, the system will be a bit different. It's not just collecting data. We, there will be a system with financial obligations, but the financial obligations will be on, again, on the importers who are the authorized CBAN declarants. So they will have to buy certificates, CBAN certificates at the same price as the EU ETS along the year. And then they will have to surrender those certificates by May of the year after. They will have to submit a report by which they will say, I have imported this number of CBAN goods or tons of CBAN goods. These are the emissions which correspond to those tons. And these are the certificates that I have bought to cover those emissions. Ah, I also paid or my exporter paid a carbon price. This is the carbon price and the carbon price will be, of course, deducted. I think what is important and I want you to, to see also is that at the customs, nothing happens. So the goods will continue flowing through the customs. There will be no stop of the goods. There will be no obligations. The only real obligation is that the authorized CBAN declarant has to be, or the importer of the CBAN goods has to be an authorized CBAN declarant. That means that before importing the CBAN goods, they will have to register and to get a number, a CBAN number. That can be done quite in advance. We, we want to start with the process already in 2025 so that by January 2026, everyone will have the authorized CBAN declarant number uh, if they have asked, of course, for, for, for this number. But nothing happens at the border. I, I didn't insist before, but I think that's something that, which is important. It was on one of my slides. The design of the system, as you can see, is mirroring all as much as we can, of course, the EU ETS. And if we don't mirror the EU ETS, it's because this is not a cap and trade system, and it's for good it's for good reasons. But of course, the way in how it has been constructed with uh, buying or purchasing CIMAN certificates, and also how we set the price of the CIMAN certificate, is the same as we have in the in the EU ETS. The system is robust in terms of uh, compliance with international obligations of the EU, and in particular, because I hear that very often. Uh, in particular with the WTO. This is not a trade measure. This is an environmental measure. Uh, and we are working very hard, of course, with the WTO in particular, in order to make sure that we reduce the administrative burden and that we don't introduce any burden, of course, on the flow, on the flow of goods through the borders. So please be reassured that uh, we have designed the system in a way that can be complex for the importers in the EU, but at the same time ensures that uh, does not put any burden on the on the trade. So on on the next slide, just to say that of course for us international cooperation is very important. We don't want to act isolated. Uh, we we know that there are a lot of initiatives around around the world at all levels, G7, G20, but also OECD, United Nations, in order to promote the decarbonization and also to promote measures how to decarbonize quicker. As you know, there will be a COP29 in Baku this year where financing will be very important. We pay a lot of attention to that. I mean, the European Union is very much committed to that. And we are also supporting a lot of decarbonization around the world. There is also the Climate Club. I, I wanted to highlight that. I'm not sure now if South Africa has signed up to the Climate Club, but this is a group of countries, of like-minded countries, which want to work together to decarbonize and to promote also decarbonization measures around, around the world. And also, for example, to share best practices, to share methodologies, how to assess emissions and how to verify, verify the emissions. The European Union is very much engaged with everyone, I mean, with all countries. I can tell you that we are doing also an, an, an in, a vast uh, outreach campaign in order to better explain CBAM, like today, but we are doing with many countries and also at multilateral level. We've been in Geneva with the WTO explaining CBAM several times. We will be again in September. So I think that there, I, we, we, we really take this seriously and we really are really committed to, to contribute to, to decarbonization. We, we have the Global Gateway, as you know, where there are a lot of opportunities for investments or to support investments. As you know, we also have the JETP to green or to make your electricity 
your energy systems greener, and the European Union is contributing a lot to that. There is also a AG a project with uh, Africa, where we are also investing heavily or, I mean, very eagerly in order to support the green transition in, in, in Africa. We, we know that Africa is one of our partners. It's one of our trade partners. We believe in the future of Africa, and we are really very much engaged in supporting. In the end, the objective is not another one that is not another than, of course, helping to decarbonize the, 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 the planet. We will continue engaging with you uh, and with the South African industry. I promise that if there is an interest, we can organize also a more detailed or ad hoc meeting on how to monitor emissions, how to understand uh, the methodology for the for the CBAM. For the moment, what you can find also in our website, it's on the, on the next slide. I mean, we have produced a lot of uh, material, like you can find trainings, you can find guidance, for exporters to the EU. Of course, you have the guidance in, in English, um, but also in other languages. We have also prepared templates where you can share your information with the importers in the EU. And we have also produced other type of, uh, uh, I mean, we have recorded webinars with the specific sectors where you can learn more uh, about the details. On the next page, you will find the website I can only encourage you to go to the website. If you press again, you will find the voila. Well, another one. This is the website. Thank you. And if you go to our website, you will find also a Q&A with the most uh, usual questions and answers that we are collecting from exporters and from importers uh, in the EU and around the world. So we try to improve this Q&A, I would say, even weekly on a weekly basis. So I can only encourage you to go there to get to know a bit more about details about, about this. And with that, sorry if I took too long, but uh, thank you very much again. Thanks a lot for this big opportunity to, to, to be present in South Africa, at least virtually, and to be able to explain a bit more about the, the CIPAM. And I will be happy to take some of the questions. I think that there are already some of them in the chat. Maybe I will take the chance now to, to go through them and and maybe after I can I can try to reply to the questions. Thank you, Chris. Over to you. Thank you very much, Desente. And really, what I found to be a very practical uh, approach, a very helpful approach. Uh, you know, explaining how it works, explaining that uh, it's the, the, there's a lot of burden on the importers in the European Union. Uh, of course, the stick is with us, uh, and it's not only a stick, but it's also an incentive to decarbonize, uh, which is good for all of us, uh, ultimately. So thank you very much indeed for that uh, practical approach. Uh, nice, well understood. And I want to assure everybody that these presentations are going to be shared tomorrow uh, in the feedback report. Uh, and you will have the opportunity to study uh, Bethente's uh, uh, presentation in much more detail, uh, in fine detail. Uh, and thank you for providing us that presentation for sharing uh, with Ente and to the European Union for their participation and contextualization of this whole issue. Uh, so we're now going to move on to our next uh, presenter, uh, who is Ishrad Kathrada. Uh, Ishrad is the special advisor to the Minister of the South African DTIC. And I believe that today they are having his farewell. Uh, as he is stepping down as the Minister of the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition after serving South Africa for, for many, many years as a minister. Ishrad has himself served as Special Advisor to the South African Minister of Trade, Industry and Competition uh, with a focus on industrial policy, climate and technology. Uh, he is leveraging his expertise in high-level policy development and thought leadership, and he aims to drive significant development outcomes in response to climate change. Um, and technological advancements. Previously, he was the executive director at JP Morgan, where he led the chief investment office credit strategy unit for North America. Uh, Ishrad has uh, developed a, uh, has been deeply involved in technology startups, both as a founder and operator in South Africa in, and in the UK. He holds an MSc in sustainability enterprise and environment from Oxford University and a Bachelor of Business Science in Finance from UCT. And I know that his work at Oxford 
uh, focused specifically on the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to have you uh, with us to, uh, today, Ishrad. Uh, we're looking forward to hearing uh, your presentation uh, and more about your work that you've done, your, your, your thesis that you did uh, at Oxford. And uh, it's great to have you here. Over to you. Thank you so much, Chris, for those uh, warm remarks and the introduction. And thank you to uh, Vicente as well for his, uh, his opening remarks. So to begin, the introduction of the EU's Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, or, or CBAM as it's called, represents a watershed moment in the evolution of climate policy. Now, however we may want to frame it as climate policy, environmental policy, as trade policy, or as the intersection of all of these, the implications of its implementation are, are far reaching. Not only will trading partners have to contend with the additional cost and administrative burden of trading with the EU and others, but increasingly we'll have to contend with the contagion of other countries around the world implementing similar mechanisms. Uh, a week from now, South Africa is expected to respond to the UK's call for comments on its CBAM policy, and we expect a number of other jurisdictions around the world to consider similar policies, including Japan, Australia, Canada, and perhaps ultimately the United States. Now, how these CBAMs are structured are thus incredibly important to the global trading system. And my hope for today's discussion is that we cover aspects of the CBAM, which can help us uh, to get a, a rounded view of how these policies may impact on the business environment in South Africa and across the developing world. And anticipating that uh, Vidente would have uh, given us a good overview, as he did, of the genesis and the intent of the CBAM, I want to spend my lot of time today really considering the implications for the South African economy. I also want to spend some time on the way forward, not only for the respective governments of the EU, for South Africa and others, but also on the, the business uh, and uh, labor environment in South Africa. But perhaps before I do, I want to perhaps contextualize some broader elements, which I think are important for us to understand as we discuss the matter of the CBAM and its impact on the global trading system. So let me start by saying the extent of anthropogenic climate change, that is climate change which results from the human effects of human activity, or from the effects rather, of human activity, and the resultant climate crisis does prompt the need for urgent access, uh, action. As global temperatures increase, greater proportions of humanity are exposed to excess heat, to drought, to floods, and other extreme weather events, with profound risk to the global food systems, increasing vulnerability for the poor. Now, this chart was recently presented by Johan Rockström, who is a renowned climate scientist and a leading authority on global sustainability issues at a talk earlier this year at the University of Oxford. The golden line reflects temperatures over 2023 relative to the experience over the last 40 odd years, and the dark black line is the experience in 2024 up until yesterday. And what we can see is that over the last 12 months, global temperatures have been at record highs. In fact, they've been more than one and a half degrees above pre-industrial levels, reaching an important threshold which we had set to mitigate climate disaster. 2023 was the hottest year on record, and the evidence for 2024 is that it is likely to be even hotter. And now the implications of an increasingly warmer climate is an increasingly unpredictable set of weather patterns that will put strain on infrastructure, on human habitats, on agriculture, and on other spaces, or rather on the spaces we call home. And as Rockstrom famously put it in one of his seminal works on planetary boundaries, the safe operating space for humanity is quickly disappearing. And so South Africa and our government is, is united in the global effort to combat the worst effects of climate change by investing in technologies and on infrastructures to both mitigate and adapt our value chains and our, and our communities accordingly. But of course, the increasing challenges of climate crisis are set against the backdrop of other challenges which are becoming increasingly present, not only in South Africa, but around the world. Economic growth is slowing, recessions loom, inflation soars, and debt burdens are weighing heavily on many nations. And these economic troubles persist, affecting millions around the world. Global inequality, both between, uh, both between countries and within countries, necessitates a range of interventions to support the most vulnerable, the COVID-19 pandemic not only highlighted this vulnerability, but also resulted in the gap between rich and poor widening. Rising food prices, in part the result of the climate crisis, puts the poor under further risk. 
The climate crisis is therefore not an isolated issue, but part of a poly crisis, a complex web of interconnected challenges. And therefore addressing this poly crisis demands a thoughtful and coordinated approach, one that mitigates the many risks to our global economy and fosters a sustainable, equitable future for all. The United Nations framework, on, uh, uh, framework for the Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC, thus provides the, the platform to address climate change within the context of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities. The UNFCCC's Paris Agreement, which represents the commitment of 195 countries around the world, including South Africa, provides the framework for binding efforts to invest in decarbonization and adaptation. Article 4 of the agreement outlines the requirements for preparing, communicating, and maintaining nationally determined contributions, or NDCs, which represent each country's plans to combat climate change. Developed and developing countries, however, have different historical contributions to climate change and varying capabilities to address it. The Paris Agreement thus includes the principle of common but differentiated responsibility and respective capabilities, which allows for flexibility in the scale and type of contributions expected from our countries, including developing countries. Importantly, the Paris Agreement includes the shared responsibility to build capacity in both the developing country, in both developed and developing countries, and it emphasizes the need for developed countries to support developing countries in meeting their climate goals through mechanisms such as financial aid, technology transfer, and knowledge sharing. Now, of course, recognizing this need for increased ambition in climate mitigation and adaptation, as Vicente uh, outlined, the EU has announced its European Green Deal, of which the CBAM is a critical part. The Green Deal includes a package of interventions with an intermediate target of reducing EU territorial emissions by 55% from their 1990 levels by the end of this decade, and a further long-term goal to reach net zero emissions by 2050. Now, in pursuit of these targets, the EU has inter alia introduced the phasing out of free allowances, free allowances under its emissions trading scheme, accompanied with the introduction of the CBAM to protect against so-called carbon leakage and dedicated investment and other support mechanisms uh, for green technologies. I think it's important to, to note that the CBAM is not intended in and of itself to reduce emissions in the EU or elsewhere in the world. Instead, it is intended as a, as a complementary mechanism to, and I quote, level the playing field and protect EU industries from unfair competition resulting from firms operating ju in jurisdictions with less stringent climate policy. Now, the matter of climate policy and competition is an important one, and it's at the heart of much of the debate around the CBAM. The development of climate legislation has been accompanied by increasing concerns about the competitiveness of domestic firms in regulated industries. Now, such, such concerns arise from the in increasing ambition of climate policy, which forces regulated firms to invest in mitigation or perhaps to purchase carbon credits or emissions allowances, all of which may reduce profitability. Such competitiveness concerns increase further in the presence of asymmetric uh, climate regulation between trading partners giving rise to what is called carbon leakage. According to data from the World Bank, just less than a quarter of global emissions is covered by carbon taxes or emissions trading, trading systems in just a handful of companies, uh, uh, sorry, uh, countries, though I should note that South Africa is one of those countries with a carbon tax covering more than 80% of our emissions. Carbon leakage reflects the practice of shifting carbon intensive production from jurisdictions with more stringent climate regulation to those with less. However, interestingly, the actual evidence of carbon leakage is mixed. In an analysis of climate legislation from 111 countries uh, from across the globe over the period from 1996 to 2018, researchers from the University of Oxford found, and I quote, no evidence of trade-related carbon leakage, and other studies have, some, have concluded similarly. The EU itself has recognized that evidence of, ex of the existence of carbon leakage is not always conclusive. However, EU legislators have argued that the perception of carbon le leakage threatens to undermine popular support for climate agendas and hence needs to be addressed in climate legislation. Up until now, the EU and other countries have used free allowances to address carbon leakage 
for these hard to abate sectors, including the manufacturing of steel, aluminium, fertilizer, cement, clothing and textiles, glass, pharmaceuticals, as well as certain mining industries. Now, these sectors have been hard to abate in particular because of their respective long investment cycles, technical challenges, and funding requirements. Free allowances for these sectors have thus muted any cost increases from increased carbon pricing. It's worth noting uh, that South Africa also has a set of free allowances under our Carbon Act, which provide for effective rebate from the carbon tax in certain industries up to as much as 90%. However, the use of free allowances is generally argue, argued as being incompatible with the pursuit of lower emissions, as it removes the incentive to decarbonize. The use of CBAM-like mechanisms or other forms of what are called border carbon adjustments have thus emerged as, as, the, as an approach which offers a means of mitigating carbon leakage in the face of increasing ambition by equalizing the carbon price between imports and domestic production. However, while the CBAM may contribute to the EU and other countries' efforts of stemming climate change, the cost and who bears it require special attention. Most studies estimate the impact of, of the CBAM on global emissions to be negligible, while many estimate that the CBAM will likely result in an increase in EU territorial emissions and a decline in other parts of the world as production in emissions intensive activities shifts to the EU at the expense of production in the rest of the world. The introduction of the CBAM is likely to have considerable and adverse effects on trading partners. For developing and less well-resourced countries, the effects, these effects may be severe, even where the direct exposure of exports to the EU is minimal. The impact of such efforts, uh, effects is estimated to widen inequality between the global south and the north in terms of both GDP and, and welfare. Regional studies on the African continent, for example, find a, a near 1% fall in aggregate GDP per annum for, for, for the continent at an 87 euro carbon price. So effectively at the price that we're at today with more pronounced effects in more export oriented countries. The UN's Trade and Development Agency, or UNCTAD, estimates decline in exports to the EU of up to uh, 6% in a scenario where an $88 tax is prevailing, creating a loss in real income for developing countries of nearly $6 billion, offset by a gain of $2.5 billion in the developing world. Now, these potential losses are compounded by the significant role which the EU plays in the largest markets for regulated goods. Now, the EU accounts for more than 50% of the imports of globally traded products regulated by the CBAM. The table shows, uh, and this comes from the research that we did last year, uh, it shows the, the details on the size of the EU market relative to global trade, with roughly 40% of globally traded aluminium, a quarter of globally traded cement and fertilizer, and 35% of globally traded iron and steel making their way into the EU. South Africa is considerably exposed to the EU, representing 19% of our exports. So notwithstanding that we may not be the largest country, the EU still represents a significantly large uh, source of exports for us as a country. In 2022, exports of CBAM regulated products, i.e. steel, aluminium, cement and fertilizer from South Africa to the EU, amounted to 10% of those exports with most of that concentrated in specific grades of steel and aluminium. Uh, these include uh, agglomerated iron ore, pig iron, ferromanganese, ferrochromium, zinc-coated flat steel, flat rolled stainless steel, rope aluminium, and aluminium alloys. Now, given this critical concentration and the importance of these industries, estimating the cost is critical. Last year, in association, association with the University of Oxford, we looked at the potential impact of the EU CBAM on the two South African industries most exposed, being uh, steel and aluminium. The introduction of the CBAM is likely to have both direct and indirect impacts on, on exporters. The direct impact refers to the potential decline in exports to the EU as a result of the imp imposition of the increased import duty. And the indirect impacts refer to those additional factors which may affect other demand and supply elements due to the rebalancing of global steel and aluminium markets. Other domestic industries may further be impacted as a result of the important linkages between these anchor sectors for South Africa and the region. So to measure the potential direct effect, we built an econometric model, 
using what's referred to as the gravity model of trade. It's a very well-known trade model, and it's used to determine the elastic elasticity of demand for, for a given duty uh, and to impose a, a, a shock into the model to see what the, 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 the demand response would be. Now, this, this direct decline in export revenue could well be compounded by additional losses as global markets respond to the implementation of the CBAM. So to, to, uh, to measure the potential indirect effects, we complemented this econometric analysis with a range of interviews with South African stakeholders, including producers in the steel and aluminium value chains, business federations, banks, researchers, as well as policymakers. So for each of South Africa's core exports affected by the EU CBAM, we estimated the implied CBAM duty using a $100 per ton carbon price at the EU border and the direct emissions intensity of production in South Africa. This resulted in an implied duty ranging from as low as 1% for stainless steel to as high as 25% for pig iron. We then introduced the shock into our model to determine the potential loss of export revenue based on the calculated elasticity of demand. Our study showed that based on a carbon price of $100 per ton in the EU, exporters in these sectors could expect a decline in exports relative to a baseline with no CBAM of up to 10%. Now, based on 2022 export levels, this would have amounted to a decline in export revenue as of, uh, of as much as $185 million or 3.5 billion rand in today's rand. In addition to the loss of revenues from falling exports to the EU, South African industries could well expect a range of other exports, uh, sorry, impacts. Stakeholder responses to our study highlighted that, highlighted that the demand side impact of the EU CBAM may well spill over, spill over into other geographies, which serve as markets for SA, steel, and aluminium, increasing competition in these markets. Such, such effects occur since as EU demand for imported steel and aluminium contracts, exporters from other markets are forced to find alternate spaces for their exported good. Uh, stakeholder responses reflected that such alternate markets are likely to be those less, to be those with less stringent climate regulation, and perhaps even the African continent, which may undermine South African exporters' attempts to exploit opportunities in the continent and may well undermine the, uh, the African continental free trade area. Stakeholder responses further, further highlighted uh, other demand side risks that may emerge from reporting of emissions. Uh, so as participants may, may well know, uh, in, the, in this transition period, all we are expected to do as exporters is report our emissions, but even that reporting may well result in demand shifts. Because notwithstanding that many, C, uh, many commodities will only have their duties levied on direct emissions, meaning the production emissions, uh, the required reporting of scope two emissions, which is the emissions from our energy grid, is likely to send an early signal that South African production is more carbon intensive and may well redirect EU imports away from South Africa before even a single duty is paid. Increased competition for scrap metal is expected to result from increased investment in electric arc furnace technology as an in intermediate step in greening the industry. And uh, as many may, may know, uh, the uh, electric uh, arc furnace production has a lower carbon foot footprint than traditional blast furnace, but it uses scrap metal as a core input. And as investment in such technology increases around the world, demand for scrap as an input increases, and this may put pressure on South African producers uh, uh, who are at a disadvantage because of the higher international prices. In addition, the same competitive dynamics which may result in producers in other markets seeking alternative spaces to export their goods, it may also result position South Africa as an attractive market for producers from other third party, uh, third countries. And thus that might increase domestic competition for South African steel and aluminium producers. Over time, the introduction of CBAMs both in the EU and around the world will impose additional costs on exporters, which cannot be adequately mitigated by our efforts to decarbonize within the, the time period available. This chart that you see over here, this map overlays the estimators from our econometric analysis with data from the World Bank to determine those countries most vulnerably exposed to the EU CBAM in iron and steel. The darker the red, the more vulnerable the country with much of that burden concentrated in the global south. The need for urgent action, uh, climate action is indeed clear. However, careful balancing of the risk and opportunities of climate policy is required. 
The purpose of the pursuit of net zero must be consistent with other sustainable development objectives for it to be considered credible. If the CBAM only serves to shift the burden from de of decarbonization from developed to developing countries without the necessary financial and technical support, it is arguably a regressive policy and one which may only serve to deepen factors in the global rules-based system. While it may be uncomfortable engaging with the historical sources of climate change, it is indeed critical. Uh, the EU is, of course, uh, historic emissions far exceed those of, of South Africa, of Africa rather, by a ratio of nearly six to one. And those early emissions from the early industrial rev revolution still contribute to climate change today. So in the face of uh, the cost which the CBAM may impose, the question is what is to be done? Uh, it is important to note that the CBAM uh, specifically uh, has been applied to deep, uh, address decarbonization hard to abate sectors, and that these sectors are deemed hard to abate in large part because of the technical and financial hurdles which need to be navigated to reduce emissions in these sectors. The South African government continues to believe that the CBAM is best addressed within the multilateral forums of the World Trade Organization and the UNFCCC. Uh, now, just in the remaining time that I have available to me, look, uh, I think it's important to note that, you know, the decarbonization of energy and production processes in developing countries will require significant funding, much of which is not available in developing countries and will not be available in the form of private and commercial bank funding. Already, South Africa has estimated that our just transition plan is estimated to require about one and a half trillion rand in investment through to 2027 to decarbonize sectors of the economy in line with our NDCs. The imposition of the CBAM in its current form will require additional investment as parts of the as parts of the economy attempt to defend its market share in the EU and other parts of the world. The implementation of the CBAM is likely to have deep and far-reaching consequences for global value chains. While the current focus is on, on, on six, sectors, is six sectors, it is clear that the ultimate expectations are for regulations to be extended to all uh, daily oil EU imports. In the absence of measures to address potential in inequity, the production uh, the introduction of the CBAM risks polarizing an increasingly divided world, creating long-lasting divisions, which may ultimately undermine the global consensus on climate action. Let me pause there. Thanks, Chris. I'll hand back over to you. Thank you very much, Ishrad. Uh, a sobering presentation, uh, looking at um, you know not just the impacts, uh, uh, both in but both the intended impacts as well as the unintended impacts uh, facing uh, countries like South Africa, but not only South Africa, but other countries in the developing world and in the South. Uh, and while still understanding, uh, you know, the desperate need for uh, interventions, uh, you know, to, to mitigate climate change uh, and uh, to help adapt to it. So uh, really, for me, that was a sobering uh, presentation uh, by somebody who's done a lot of study work uh, on this subject. And it's been an honor to, to have you with us today, uh, uh, Israel. So with that, we're going to move on to the next presentation uh, before our comfort break. Uh, and that is uh, by Deepak Patel, uh, an old friend and colleague of mine, who's the head of climate finance and innovation at the uh, Presidential Climate Commission. Uh, Deepak joined the South African Presidential Climate Commission in June 2021 as head of the climate finance and innovation. He leads the team in, in its work in the areas of climate finance mapping, financing a just transition and developing a strategy for financing the pathway to a net zero emissions target for 2050. The PCC is mandated to advise on all aspects of South Africa's climate change response. Deepak is a non-executive director on the board of Transnet and prior to joining the PCC, he was a special advisor to the Minister of Public Enterprises from 2018 to 2020. Deepak is a chemical engineer and a qualified art artisanal brewer my goodness, uh, that's an interesting one, uh, Deepak. With an MSc in uh, Development Economics from the University of London and an MBA from the University of the Witwatersrand. So great to have you and have a person from the PCC uh, giving us their insights today. Over to you, Deepak. Um, thank you very much. Um... Can you share your presentation, Deepak? Yes. Thank you. That's great. That we work? can see it. Yes. Very yeah. good. Um, 
I'd like to make a few disclaimers as well as then maybe a few introductory remarks. Um, firstly, CBAMs are going to make a very direct um, impact on South Africa's competitiveness as far as some of its critical exports are concerned. That's a given. Secondly, the PCC's mandate is to look at all aspects of the climate response, but through the lens of a just transition. And while the PCC up till now has been largely focused on what a just transition means for the domestic environment, what is becoming clear is that there's also the question of global justice as different individual countries make their own responses, sometimes sincerely in the name of climate response, but sometimes um, with forked tongue. What I'm going to do is read out a few of the responses I was able to glean from just talking to some of our commissioners. And it's important to bear in mind that the PCC is made up of commissioners from all parts of South African society. So almost verbatim, I'm going to quote some of the comments that I've received in the last few weeks on the question of CBAM. Firstly, it goes against the spirit of the United Nations Convention um, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change in the sense that these are multilateral processes which are geared towards decarbonizing the global system, but CBAMs are in fact unilateral in their um, 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 implementation. It therefore goes against the spirit of multilateralism in the light of them being unilateral. While they are couched as a climate response, they are first and foremost motivated by protecting domestic sectors in developed countries. The sectors products targeted are in hard to abate sectors. We've heard some of them, iron and steel, cement, glass, fertilizer, hydrogen. As such, they are actually punitive to developing country industrial sectors and therefore their economic growth and pathway prospects to decarbonizing in the future. The products targeted are themselves probably essential for developing countries' pathways towards renewable energy in the first instance and decarbonization in the medium to long term. In the absence of developed countries delivering on their promises to provide climate finance for decarbonization transitions and the barriers to technology transfer the CBAMs are therefore purely punitive and self-protective. CBAMs potentially flout the non-discrimination principles of the WTA law and policy, which has to do both with multilateral fairness as well as domestic um, preferential treatment. Having said that, and these um, critiques aside, as the PCC, we are quite committed to undertaking a process through which we arrive at a position and therefore disclaimer. We have not yet arrived as the PCC to a position on CBAMs, particularly in the context of advising on what the domestic response should be as we undertake our own just transition. However, if we scan the environment around the world, what we can see is that several countries either are considering CBAM-like legislation themselves or have put in place some mechanism to inject a carbon price into their domestic economies. And in this respect, it's quite interesting to see that the responses have been either ETS and carbon tax together, ETS on their own, and of course, in the case of the European Union, an ETS that, that preceded now the CBAM. And so it's interesting to note that this is part of a process of um, Europe responding to the injection of a carbon price, firstly in its domestic economy and now at its border. We want to look at what the implications are in South Africa of having committed through our NDCs to a particular trajectory to 2030 and to another trajectory which we will be which we will be advising government on 
with respect to a new NDC that will take us to 2035. But as the country, we have committed to a pathway to net zero to around about 2050. This presupposes then that, that pathway, taking into account what the current emissions in South Africa looks like, we are left with a, and I don't want to get too technical here, with an analysis of the area below the trajectory that gives us in effect a carbon budget. And as a country, we have committed through our NDCs to pursue a path that combines just transition elements as well as industrial transformation, which then means that in South Africa, we have to make choices within that carbon budget about where through our sectoral emissions um, or sets, we allocate those resources. What the CBAM does is in effect imposes by way of describing what goods are going to be subjected to the CBAM imposes in effect, in effect a, a um, carbon budget on certain sectors of the economy. And therefore it may be arguable that um, it takes away some degree of sovereignty with respect to pathways choice making. By way of more concrete example, let's look at what happens in the heavy manufacturing sector, in particular with respect to those items that are contained in the CBAM, but which we consider to be absolutely critical to undertake our own journey in the short term to a renewable energy future, but in the long term to a future where we decarbonize as well as have sectors that are competitive. And this shows that the emissions um, trajectory in all likelihood, if we are to implement our renewable energy program as anticipated um, over the next five years by the Just Energy Transition Investment Plan, and that in large part is an acceleration of strengthening of the grid, um, putting down largely private sector investments in solar wind, um, solar PV and wind, as well as battery energy storage, we are likely to see just in order to set the base for a longer term decarbonization an increase in emissions from the critical areas that are in fact almost directly coincidental with what the CBAM targets. Having said that, as the PCC, we have to navigate a set of complexities that involve not only the need to have consensus amongst our social partners, but also advise to the extent that that advice might be heeded on what our opportunities might be in the face of a world where I think, not yet the PCC, I think we're going to get more CBAM-like um, impositions and a very messy intercompetitive space as a result of these unilateral moves being made in the first instance by developed countries quickly to be followed by similarly aggressive mechanisms in response um, by the larger developing countries. We are quite clear as a country that we are sincere in our response to climate change. And as a result of the mechanisms that we've put in place through our policy and, implement, and um, legislative frameworks, um, we have a clearly articulatable system of how South Africa intends to make good on its common but differentiated commitment reflected by our nationally determined contributions into the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC process, and therefore believe that we ourselves are on a journey that should be, um, for want of a better word, country-led. South Africa's NDC targets clearly stipulate how we intend by 2030 to establish a base, and then in the next NDC, to 2035, how we intend to accelerate the processes down to net zero by around about 2050. However, in anticipation that the issues related to socioeconomics um, as we undertake this journey are properly analyzed rather than based on rhetoric, polemic, or intuitive feeling, we've commissioned a study which is now quite close to completion 
and its results will be shared at an appropriate time. But I'm going to give you a flavor of some of the analysis that is being undertaken and some of the results that are beginning to emerge. Through a process of E3ME modeling, which is multi-regional modeling, um, we've, um, um, together with Cambridge Econometrics, put in place a cross-comparative analysis based on various climate response scenarios. BAU, BAU refers to business as usual in the rest of the world, business as usual in South Africa. Net zero refers to our own process of undertaking a journey to net zero by 2050. BAU, obviously, in this case, business as usual in the rest of the world. Business as usual in South Africa, while the rest of the world makes a, a concerted effort to keep within 1.5 degrees Celsius, as we know, we've already surpassed that in February. Net zero and the world, the rest of the world does its bit with respect to climate responsiveness. What does this throw out in terms of a set of factors that we've looked at as far as economic impact is concerned? And here we see that if we take the business as usual, business as usual scenario um, um, as the base case, um, under that scenario, we in fact um, shoot our NDC upper range. And the outcome, as we know, is that we're going to have a global climate of greatly, of absolutely over three degrees Celsius. However, if we choose a net zero pathway while the rest of the rest of the world operates business as usual, we in fact have a GDP uplift. And there we can see that um, in terms of employment, we have a slight uplift. The cautionary here is that this, this assumes that the economic structure and the sectors at play in the economy remain largely, largely unchanged and do not cover the opportunities that result from new as well as nascent industries being developed over the medium to long term. If we continue as business as usual while the rest of the world embarks on their um, um, 1.5 degree Celsius oriented journey, we can see that GDP in South Africa actually declines um, quite dramatically. Um, and our emissions um, as a result of that declining economic activity um, is also more muted than the BAU, BAU scenario. If we have a net zero target as well, um, um, my, my apologies, um, I've, I've covered that. I think this slide speaks for itself. That leads us tentatively to the conclusion that our criticisms of the CBAM aside, we as a country need to accelerate and show intent in our global contribution to decarbonization, while at the same time, all of the analysis is showing that that is in fact, regardless of what the rest of the world does or doesn't do on a multilateral or unilateral basis, that we need to ensure that we undertake the journey to decarbonizing in the first instance, our electricity sector and in the medium term, our transport sector, but accompanying that must be for reasons of competitiveness now that CBAMs are here, to maintain that competitiveness, certain of our industrial sectors also need to be assisted um, to um, undertake their own journeys to decarbonize. Chris, I'm going to stop there and I have no doubt that um, I think I've given back time to you, um, which yeah. hopefully will make for much more interesting conversation um, when we invite the panelists in. Thank you very much. Deepak, yeah, I'd like to thank you for, for that. Uh, you know, it was a, a talk that really, you know, discussed that in the impacts, uh, the negative impacts that we kind of feel, or kind of, we feel we're going to face. But I love, I really appreciated your final con your comments, uh, of those different scenarios, which actually show that whatever we think about CBAM, and uh, we, we can cry about it being unfair or not, uh, the point is we've got to do something, uh, whether CBAM exists or not, and that is to decarbonize, and uh, that will effectively uh, ensure we are also remaining competitive. Uh, we, we have to decarbonize. Uh, it's best for our economy. It's best for us.
is not a burden on us. It's actually an opportunity for us, uh, a better opportunity uh, than business as usual. Uh, so uh, I think that was a really interesting dynamics of your presentation. Colleagues, I'm going to now call a five-minute uh, comfort break instead of a 10-minute. We are still um, you know, behind time. Uh, so I'm going to um, call a five-minute uh, comfort break and ask you to be back here at... Um, at 15.25. It's now 15.19, nearly 15.20. So if you can be back here at 15.25 sharp, uh, we will get underway for the next part of this webinar where we have some great further presentation, two great further presentations and a Q&A session. Uh, start to this webinar with three, what I call really enlightening presentations, very, very thought-provoking indeed. And uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our um, uh, fourth speaker, which is Gaylo Montpasson Clear. And Gaylo is a senior economist at the Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies, or TIPS, uh, which is a South African based economic policy research institute. He leads TIPS's work on sustainability and just transition and is the facilitator for the South African Renewable Energy Master Plan, or SARAM, uh, which is the industrialization plan for South Africa's renewable energy and battery storage value chain. Prior to that, Gaylor worked in uh, economic diplomacy and international organizations. He holds two master's degrees, one in international affairs from the Institut d'Etudes Politiques uh, or Science PO of Grenoble, France, and uh, in energy and environmental econo economics from the Grenoble uh, Faculty of Economics in France. He has a PhD, or sorry, he is a PhD candidate in economics at the University of Johannesburg, UJ. So with that, uh, welcome uh, Gaylor, and uh, may I now hand over to you to deliver your presentation. Thanks a lot, uh, Chris. Uh, just now I thought you were granting me a PhD. I was I was so glad, <laughs> um, but uh, not quite there yet, but in the process uh, indeed. Um, so it's a uh, real pleasure to uh, to be uh, with you today uh, and uh, a good day to, to everyone. Uh, you know, who's joining this discussion. Uh, it's really difficult to um, to go after Earshad and, and, and DPAC uh, when it comes to, to issues around CBAM. Uh, this great alignment in terms of our thinking. Uh, I promise you, I wasn't just cooking up my presentation in the tea break to, to just agree with them. And um, so it will, uh, I think, enable me to, to go fairly fairly rapidly on a number of points. Um, and of course, uh, Bichette did done a really comprehensive introduction of, of CBAM itself. And so we, we obviously don't have to, to repeat that. Um, so that's that's really a great um, starting point. And I guess as a where introduction, I, we have to certainly acknowledge, uh, as was raised by the previous uh, speakers, that there's a global global transition that is on the way uh, and that it is it is it is accelerating uh, and it is not uh, itself effectively uh, an envir environmental issue but it is primarily uh, a socioeconomic challenge that we're dealing with uh, which is of transforming our societies and and our economies and of course that then very rapidly directly translate into trade and industrial development um implications across across the board uh and, and of course that brings risks and, and opportunities in terms of remaining competitive uh, when it comes to manufacturing uh, exports uh, and broadly uh you know uh, uh, economic development we see a number of channels that play a role in effectively uh directing the impacts of, of the transition, and they are multiple. A few that are relevant for, for today uh, are, of course, calm, uh, climate change regulations, like, like carbon pricing, uh, but also what we see increasingly uh, are shifts in, in trade patterns away from carbon-intensive products 
or carbon intensive uh, jurisdictions. We've also noted quite a big green industrial policy push, and um, notably uh, in the US with the Inflation Reduction Act, but also in the EU, uh, as well as a number of, of other countries uh, like China, Brazil, uh, compounded um, by effectively a scramble between the EU, the US and China for critical minerals to maintain uh, effectively competitiveness in new green technologies and capturing the rents associated with the development of, of these green technologies uh, across the board. Adding to this is really the topic of, of today, which is green protectionism, uh, which takes different forms effectively uh, and is not really a new topic. Uh, it has been uh, discussed uh, for, for many, many years. Um, you know, I remember uh, actually already back in uh, 2009, when I used to uh, work at, uh, at UNEP, uh, writing a joint paper between UNEP and WTO on uh, green protectionism and climate and trade measures uh, and things like CBAM, which were not called CBAM back then, but we already discussed. As raised, um, many countries are, are looking at implementing their own uh, green protectionist measures, and that is the context that we operate in. And so, really importantly, uh, the European Union CBAM is really, uh, in my mind, uh, the tree that hides the forest. You know, we focus a lot on it because it is emblematic in its design and its impact, but uh, we should not forget the broader ecosystem. First, from a European perspective, the European Green Deal is very comprehensive and it has a number of external impacts. Virtually every sector of the economy, even those that are not going to be impacted in the short term by CBAM, will be impacted by the European Green Deal, be it from uh, the, form, uh, to, uh, the farm to fork strategy or the regulations on deforestation or the shift to uh, electric vehicles uh, or the circular uh, economic action plan or uh, you know, some of the ESG reporting, uh, you name it. Literally every sector is going to be impacted one way or the other. Uh, in addition to that, it's been said before, many other countries are considering their own, uh, their own CBAM, uh, predominantly uh, in, in the global north. And uh, as I said in introduction, the space to develop and remain competitive effectively in a decarbonized world is uh, increasingly limited. Um, particularly for countries in the global south, because of the very big green industrial policy packages being uh, provided and developed in the global north, and that scramble for critical minerals, again, uh, from the perspective of security of access from global north countries, uh, and obviously uh, reducing the uh, opportunities from countries in the global south. So that is effectively the context in which we are operating. Now, um, what are uh, possible avenues to, to respond uh, to, to CBAM developments for uh, South Africa and other countries in, in the global south? And that will be effectively the, the core of, of, my, of my input today. Uh, well, the first, the first thing uh, which I want to stress is that we need to really get cracking on putting together the monitoring, reporting, and verification infrastructure at the com company level, but also, of course, at a country level, and, and make sure that it is well aligned uh, with our uh, reporting requirements, because that we want it or not, um, measures like CBAM are uh, coming and are actually already implemented, and we need to find a way to report. And so if we don't have the infrastructure, that's going to hamper our economy and, and our uh, industry. So that is something that for me uh, has to be fast-tracked very, very rapidly. <clears throat> the first then uh, effective avenue, uh, which I'll go uh, more into is the diplomatic route. You know, it can be through more formal channels uh, like the WTO or, or, or the NFCCC or even the G20, as well as bilateral negotiations more informally. 
and it should be an in, you know an ongoing strategy. It, it carries fairly low risk in my opinion, but uh, as I'll get into it, it has a relatively uncertain chance of success. Uh, the second avenue is around a green industrial policy route, really focused on supporting affected value chains uh, and shifting to low carbon energy systems. It's a medium term strategy. Uh, it may not you know, uh, generate immediate benefits uh, for those uh, impacted. Um, uh, and it has some short term uh, costs, but it, it's clear that it has long term benefits and, and it's the way to go uh, in any event uh, as uh, really uh, illustrated by uh, some of the numbers that uh, that Deepak put forward. And then we have we have a fiscal policy route, um, and, and that's about aligning our, our carbon price domestically with the CBAM, uh, so as to retain effectively the revenues into the country. Uh, it it is very much a short term uh, high risk option in our in our context. Um, because it doesn't really directly help uh, a lot of the companies, but you know should be certainly considered as the last thing we want is to see any uh, proceeds uh, effectively flow uh, flow from South Africa to the EU uh, related to CBAM, and we should find ways to retain these revenues no matter what. Um, and then lastly, uh, there is possibly I guess a trade route, which is to then find alternative markets. Uh, and shift from uh, the EU uh, to other possible uh, markets. That would be a short-term, relatively uncertain options, and it would have quite quite long-term uh, risks, um, because of course we are shifting to a more uh, decarbonized uh, world. So uh, I wanted to really sort of preface this um, so that uh, I can now go a little bit deeper in each of these routes. Uh, in the uh, second half of, of my input. So diplomatic route, uh, it, it would really be about gathering some momentum with other countries in the global south. You know, we have to obviously acknowledge that if we go at it alone, uh, from a South African perspective, the likelihood of success is very low. And so we have to acknowledge that, you know, particularly on the African continent, there's a number of other countries that are going to be greatly impacted uh, by CBAM, and uh, countries that are uh, among the least developed countries, uh, you know, often uh, in in the planet, and you know, uh, in totality low or, or medium income uh, income countries, and so we could really contribute to leading the charge, uh, as actually done uh, already by the South African government, in trying to create a coalition of countries um, with our neighbors on on the continent. Uh, that are also deeply impacted uh, by, by CBAM, acknowledging that most African countries are actually going to be impacted more by other EU regulation rather than uh, CBAM directly, but a number of them, as you see on the graph, will face some impacts. Of course, we could expand that to uh, our uh, political alliances, uh, like the BRICS plus uh, countries, uh, many are uh, faced with great, uh, great impact as well themselves uh, when it comes to the CBAM. And so some sort of a coalition uh, of, of nodes could, could be formed to effectively um, push back on uh, measures of green protectionists uh, like, uh, like the CBAM. Mm -hmm. The diplomatic route itself, um, you, you, can, you, can, you can imagine, uh, is defensive uh, and it is Quite a principled approach. Uh, it is morally important, um, you know, uh, because it is justified certainly uh, on, on the basis of historical responsibilities. Um, but it cannot be the only response. I think that is really important to, to note. Um, I think Yasha had spoken about it. Uh, you know, of course, there is you know a historical debt, um, climate debt for wealthy countries. Um, and you know to be compatible with the uh, you know spirit of the climate regime, you know it is really uh, important to push back against measures uh, that are uh, seen as green protectionism. Um, when we have particularly countries on the continent um, that are only responsible for three percent of historical uh, emissions, um, it is extremely unjust and unfair for any of these countries to bear any uh, of uh, burden 
uh, associated with uh, with green protectionist uh, measures when effectively the uh, liability uh, falls on the global north countries uh, as well as you know of course largely high income households and large corporation uh, in addition to that it was it was raised before there's relatively weak evidence when it comes to uh, carbon leakage occurring um, and this is quite logical because there are many factors that contribute to any company deciding on where it would invest. Uh, and often carbon regulation is way down the bottom of a list of factors and uh, that would decide where effectively uh, a country would, would choose to invest and, and, and produce. Of course, um, a diplomatic approach could bring some temporary benefit if it were to be successful. Um, it could come in the form of a longer implementation time frame. It could be maybe a differentiated rollout uh, per country based on greenhouse gas emissions or on development status, or it could bring uh, some additional financial support or, or, or compensation for a number of countries. But we have to acknowledge that I think the chances of success are, are, are low and, and possibly distant in the future, kind of too little too late, uh, especially given the dysfunctionality of the WT regime. Uh, it would also mean that we need to have quite a united front between global South countries, which sometimes appears quite difficult uh, with some countries uh, like India uh, having indicated that they are ready to negotiate bilaterally rather than uh, militarily. Um, and importantly, it would not prevent industry um, from having to decarbonize and transform in the future um, because it's really just a, a stopgap measure effectively. And so it cannot be the only, the only approach uh, going forward. The second route um, is the green industrial policy one, and it starts from you know, acknowledging that South Africa's exports, particularly manufacturing exports, are uh, very carbon intensive uh, by global standards, and that South Africa is an outlier uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the carbon intensity of exports, primarily due to, of course, the uh, cold fire power uh, uh, system that, that we have in the country, uh, and that is rapidly changing, but uh, still carbon intensive. So if you want to remain uh, competitive going forward, this picture effectively uh, has, to, has to change. Uh, in addition to that, we, we see uh, that, of course, most of carbon that is embodied in South Africa's export is dominated by uh, basic, uh, basic metals, uh, and and so you know clearly heavy industry uh, is is a key element of uh, South Africa's carbon intensity, uh, and these are sectors that are heavily at risk. And of course, both aluminium and steel, which are the two sectors that would be impacted in South Africa by by CBAM, fall into uh, into that category. Uh, on, on top of that, um, we've seen massive imports now of a number of green products uh, into the South African economy, um, and and. You know, uh, while it depicts the significant rise of renewable energy in the country, it is a missed opportunity uh, for us to invest in those new industries and effectively then tap into the opportunities going forward to manufacture these green goods uh, that would effectively drive the, uh, the economy uh, of, of, of tomorrow. Uh, this is also illustrated uh, in, in South Africa's uh, export of green goods, um, where you can see uh, that effectively on the left hand side, you have the exports, uh, primarily driven by uh, uh, catalytic converters historically, um, and, and much, much lower uh, effectively than uh, if you take catalytic converters out than any of the imports. Uh, and that is to 2020, because after that, uh, the graph that I showed you in the slide before just really distorts this picture with a massive, massive spike effectively in imports. And so how do we kind of grow exports of green goods out of South Africa uh, is, is the important picture that, that we need to look at. Um, we also need to, to make a lot of progress when it comes to efficiency and, and you know, bank, uh, energy management. Um, the you know, certification of companies with ISO 50001, it's just one indication. It's not a perfect one, but it does show that there's a lot more that we could do in driving energy related performance in, in the country. Uh, if we compare that to our peers, we are, uh, you know, we, we could do certainly, certainly better. Uh, so a proactive route really uh, is, is a no regret uh, 
you know, uh, avenue for, for South Africa as far as green industrial policy and energy policy is concerned. Um, it really would help uh, to decrease exposure. And in time, it would generate material competitiveness benefit. Um, it would, however, require some short-term uh, public support, as well some uh, public and private investment in greening the existing industrial value chain and uh, developing new green activities. Um, importantly, though, it, it may not prevent from the short-term exposure to CBAM because, uh, as it was again stressed before, decarbonizing industries like steel and aluminium take time, uh, and uh, it would rely on a large scale rollout of renewable energy, uh, potentially um, green hydrogen, and new production processes that have not been rolled out at commercial scales anywhere in the world. Uh, in, in in a number of cases. The fiscal policy route uh, relies on uh, raising our, our, our carbon price. And, you know, I think it's kind of a last resort option um, for, from a South African perspective. It's been stressed. We have a carbon tax. Uh, it is relatively low by a global standard, but it covers a wide uh, part of the economy, 80%. So it is it is a really comprehensive one. Uh, and it would just be a way of retaining the revenues uh, into the South African economy. There are some problems with it, though. Um, first, it leads to accepting a global North carbon price, uh, which, uh, of course, uh, is politically highly problematic. Um, it would not directly help companies because they would still have to pay that carbon price extremely high. Um, of course, if we run as well a selective higher carbon pricing for only certain industries or even just for exports, it, it could be challenged by certain CBAM implementers uh, going forward. Uh, and of course, we have a challenge domestically that National Treasury uh, is opposed to ring fencing and the recycling of carbon tax revenues to uh, industry decarbonization. And so uh, there's no guarantee that any carbon price paid by uh, domestic companies would then uh, be fed back to them to decarbonize. And so it is, in my mind here, very much a last result uh, option. Uh, if we look uh, then lastly at the trade route, um, what we see is that, of course, South Africa is one of uh, the few sort of carbon exporter effectively. Um, and, and that is the reality that we're into. Uh, and so finding uh, alternative markets uh, could really prove uh, prove difficult. Um, it really emerges as an uncertain uh, trajectory and probably quite short-sighted. Now, um, finding new markets for South Africa's carbon-intensive product in an inclusive, competitive, and low-carbon world uh, seems like a very difficult equation to solve. Um, in addition to that, it would not prevent industries from having to decarbonize going forward uh, and would probably put them uh, on top of that on the back foot to do so. Um, and so you know, we've already seen some shift in, in the markets already in South Africa's exported emission, as uh, the graph uh, show, uh, geographically, but also in terms of sectors. And so it's probably more sensible, certainly, to carry on uh, on a trajectory uh, uh, that furthers uh, the shifts going forward. So in conclusion, um, what we see is that you know the global transition is is uh, is underway, um, and that yes, as illustrated by previous speakers, you know, green protectionist measures like CBAM, from a global south perspective, are unjust. Um, they bring an additional burden on struggling economies and companies. They are not compatible with the climate regime. Um, it could lead to a reversal of climate finance, uh, and they're unilateral. Um, and go against the multilateralism and you know the principle of national uh, nationally determined contribution in the climate uh, framework. However, they have been a long time coming and are part of a new reality that we like it or or not. And so it commands a proactive approach from the South African perspective. You know, first establishing the MRV systems, including the integration of our domestic carbon pricing, is critical. Then. We clearly need to fast track the low carbon energy transition and further drive the rollout of renewable energy, complementing or accelerating even further 
uh, the drive that we've seen, particularly over the last couple of years for, for renewable energy. We need to foster the rollout of new production processes. And here it's multiple. It's green industrial policy support coming from the South African government. It's private sector investment in new business model. But it's also a push for global parent companies to support their global South subsidiaries. Um, Often now here, you know, uh, well, you know, we're putting CBAM on, on big corporations. Uh, and that is true. These are big corporations. But they are not helped the way they should be by the parent company in Europe or uh, in, in other global North countries. And we need to push further for global North support to decarbonizing local industries, uh, particularly, of course, in, in LDCs and, and uh, low-income countries, but also, of course, in the South African context. And then lastly, yes, active diplomacy can play a role, uh, certainly to increase the space and the resources for us to adapt uh, and to make sure that effectively climate measures are compatible with the climate regime. But it's only through a comprehensive response that effectively we can hope to reap the benefits of the new climate and trade regime going forward. Uh, I thank you all. And uh, Chris, uh, back to you. Thank you so much, Kaylo. Also, a fantastic presentation. Uh, really, you know, acknowledging the apparent unfairness of this, the injustice of it, <laughs> uh, but realizing that, that we need to respond to it. Uh, and it's something that's in progress, not just the European Union, but in many jurisdictions. Uh, and it's a question of how we how we respond. And uh, and again, a deeply thought-provoking presentation, uh, and uh, also practical in its suggestions of the various responses that South Africa could have uh, to CBM. Practical responses, positive responses, not necessarily just negative uh, responses, but uh, you know the positive things that would help our economy uh, in the in the decarbonisation. And, and and I see this as something as an opportunity for the competitive advantages that we do have in South Africa. We, we need to capitalize on our competitive advantages and, uh, and, and not uh, cry about uh, how disadvantages, disadvantaged we are or have been. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for that. And we're now gonna move on to our last uh, presenter. Uh, and that is a representative uh, from the manufacturing sector in South Africa that is deeply affected by uh, CBAM uh, and is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, facing these real um, threats. Uh, and, and we're interested to hear what Hendrik de Villiers has to say. He's the head of the environmental sustainability at Hewleman and um, also a member of the energy intensive user group. Uh, Hendrik leads uh, Hewleman's environmental sustainability initiatives and the resources efficiency team focusing on gas, electricity, and water efficiency sustainability initiatives. Hewleman has an aluminum rolling mill in South Africa and produces aluminum beverage can stock, aluminum plate, foil, and heat exchanger materials for the automotive industry, amongst other products, about 60% of which are exported. Hendrik leads, facilitates, and partakes in the Hewleman initiatives aimed at navigating the challenges of the changing energy um, uh, market and worldwide shifts taking place in terms of customer environmental demands and legislation and taxation, which we're talking about today. Hendrik holds a mechanical engineering degree from Pretoria University and a Bachelor of Commerce degree in business management. So it's great to have you here. I know you're not uh, talking, uh, you know, necessarily on behalf of the uh, energy intensive user group as a whole, but you are a member of them and you understand their challenges and, and issues. So we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Henrik, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, thank you for all our uh, webinar uh, listeners. So the presentation that I will do today is much more practical uh, oriented, uh, and I'm not going to deal with all the difficult topics that the previous presenters uh, dealt with already. But I'm going to try and give you a view of uh, how this impacts an industry like Illumin. I have to recognize my sustainability manager, Sané uh, Ndlalose, who is uh, instrumental in Illumin in dealing with the nuts and bolts of how to uh, report on CBAM. And um, she's unfortunately not able to be here, so I'm doing this presentation on behalf of the two of us. So during my presentation today, 
uh, I'm going to cover um, the following topics. I will give you a quick introduction to Uluman and our manufacturing processes for the benefits of those that, that don't necessarily understand the aluminium industry. Uh, thirdly, I will look at the practical in implications of, of what this means for an industry like us. How do we actually uh, enable ourselves to report? And then um, in the fourth uh, point, I will look at the proposed implementation of CBAM and the likely impact of that. And then lastly, the mitigation measures that are available to a company like ourselves. So to kick off with the introduction to Uleman. Um, Uleman is situated in Peter Maritzburg in KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, the company underwent a large scale uh, expansion during 98 uh, 99, and the facility that you see uh, on the top left-hand side um, was hugely expanded and the site was filled and it rolled over to the facility that you see on the opposite of the Duzi River on the bottom right-hand side. And this now forms an integrated plant. The one can't work without the other. The, some of the processes are on one side and the balance of the processes are on the old site. Um, our process starts right at the beginning where we uh, we get aluminium either in melt, uh, molten aluminium form or in, in solidified ingot form uh, from our up, uh, upstream um, smelter supplier, uh, right down through the rolling mills into a coated uh, sometimes product and uh, treated uh, according to customer specifications. The uh, market segments in which we are active include automotive, uh, some construction materials, we produce foil, general engineering products that uh, mostly consist of machinable quality aluminium, heat treated uh, for strength, etc. A large volume of our market is packaging material, which is largely the can body stock as well as the can end stock going into beverage cans. And then we have some extruded products going into some of the solar uh, PV modules. Um, this is a very busy slide. Um, those of you that want to cast your eyes over the slide can do that. Uh, it is basically a quick summary of our 2023 financial results. Uh, and you can see this in our published results. My focus today is to draw your attention to the fact that we are situated in South Africa. And for 2023, our export, our local uh, consumption of our product was roughly 51% of revenue. And then the second point to note is that our exports to the EU uh, constituted 22% of our revenue. And thirdly, 18% uh, to North America. So that is just uh, to, to put into perspective uh, the importance of the EU and the implied CBAM for Uleman. Um, to take you quickly through a look at what our manufacturing processes uh, look like, we are in a heavy industry. And if I start with our input materials, as I already mentioned, we do get virgin aluminium or raw aluminium from the smelter in the form of either liquid metal or uh, solidified ingot. We buy in alloying elements uh, to make up the aluminium alloys that we sell from all over the world. Then we have our process uh, scrap or reworked internal scrap that also goes back into our own melting furnaces. And then we have scrap from our direct customers that they send back to us. This is called uh, pre-consumer scrap. The consumer has not seen it yet, but our customer has seen it. And then lastly, we also have scrap that is actually recycled post-consumer, like uh, beverage cans that are recycled, collected from wherever, and somehow make their way back to Uleman that is the recycling sources. It goes into a melting furnace. We've got three of these large melting furnaces that are in the range of 55 to 80 tons of metal. Um, inside the melting furnace, we melt the aluminum with gas, and we also put in all the alloying elements and control the chemistry. And from there, we cast it and solidify the metal into molds. And from there, we produce the solid 15 ton approximately. Uh, aluminium ingots, which are then ready for rolling in our next process. Um, so going on from there, what you see here is a typical uh, pusher re a reheat furnace, where these ingots are heated up to four, 500 degrees, ready for hot rolling in a typical rolling mill. The people in the uh, stainless steel and steel 
industry will recognize a rolling oil. We roll this ingot down to a thin gauge where we can then take it to our finishing mill. And there it is rolled down to a final coilable gauge. And this is a refer reversing mill that uh, rolls the gauge down in each pass, normally three passes, until we get a coil that we can then pass on to our next stage, which is cold rolling. So here you can see coils coming into one of three of our cold mills. And um, we also have two similarly constructed foil mills. And here the coils are re rolled uh, repeatedly until we reach the final gauge. From there, the coils are then sent to our finishing lines where they are either just edge trimmed or multi-slit in a case like this, uh, and even coated uh, on our coating lines, et cetera. And the final product is then packaged and shipped to our customers locally and overseas. So that's a very brief overview of our processes. And then uh, just to now have a look at what does the fact that we need to report on CBAM and uh, eventually pay the taxes on CBAM mean for a manufacturing industry like us. So I'm going to cover this, uh, first of all, by saying that we all talk about CO2 or CO2 equivalent, but how does one actually measure those greenhouse gas emissions? And in our case, the answer is, well, actually, they are not measured at all. We have no means of measuring them. What we do measure is the, um, the scope one emissions, which is the direct emissions created in our processes. And that is determined by measuring the amount of gas. And in the case of Uluman, that is LPG or natural gas. And we combust that in our furnaces, as I've shown, uh, during each applicable stage of the process. So by measuring the amount of gas that we use and then applying a specific emission factor of that gas, a number of CO2 uh, equivalent units per unit of gas, we can determine the, um, the emissions, uh, the direct emissions or scope one emissions for uh, all of the gas that we've consumed in our process. In the case of energy or scope two emissions, that is from energy use, and that is determined by measuring the amount of electricity that we consume during each stage of our process. And the ESCOM supplied electricity has a specified emission factor that is determined annually. And that is specified in terms of kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour that you have consumed. So in this way, we've got our scope one and scope two emissions uh, sorted out. Then there are further indirect emissions, excluding energy. And that is defined as your scope three emissions. And here, yeah, there's a variety of things like employee travel and fuel for our tractors and uh, forklifts and uh, all of the other products that we buy in. Everything basically gets included here if it is material. And the most important thing to note here is that this includes all of the greenhouse gases that are embedded in the metal and the hardeners or the alloying elements that we put into our melting furnaces. So this is a major impact for Uleman because, as you know, the smelter is also in South Africa using the same electricity that we use, which is where the very high emissions uh, for South Africa comes from. So if I just cover this fourth bullet here, um, since Uleman produces products that fall into nine different categories, these are called CN codes or combined nomenclature codes of the EU uh, for the purposes of reporting CBAM. And within each of those nine categories, we supply a variety of product variations, uh, both for export and local consumption. The implications are that the energy consumption and the source of aluminium inputs that was used for each ingot produced or each coil that we eventually processed has to be measured individually during each process step so that reporting of exactly what was shipped to our customers can be done accurately. Uh, you can start to imagine the magnitude of what this means for us. Uh, furthermore, the last bullet, tracking metal inputs and measuring the energy consumption of more, uh, across more than 50 of our processes accurately and allocating it to a specific ingot or coil produced, and some of them are batch processes, with a th about 1,500 ingots or coil in the process at any given moment, this implies a large, uh, a vast infrastructure of power, gas, and other meters that are connected to live metal tracking and process monitoring systems. 
so that is the practical implication of how you measure your emissions and what you can actually report in the end. When a customer says that I have imported X amount of tons of CN category XYZ uh, with a certain product specification attached to that, what is the carbon footprint of that product that you sold me? This is how we do it. If I just uh, go further and I just explain a little bit about the borders of CBAM, the red rectangle here, and uh, by the way, this is sourced off the um, European Union CBAM website. Uh, I've listed the source here, so this is publicly uh, available information for everybody. This is how the borders of the scope of CBAM is defined by the red rectangle. Now, if I start in the bottom, uh, in the top left-hand corner, this is primary aluminium, and it falls outside the scope of what Uluman does. But you can see the aluminium smelter is inside the border there, and that is where we get our raw aluminium or virgin aluminium from. And the impact of the embedded carbon in that aluminium that we buy in is part of our scope three emissions, and that comes into Uluman. On the top right-hand right side, there's the secondary aluminium production, which includes scrap recycling, refiners, and some scrap remelters. And we do source some of our material from there, and they will have their scope three impact. Uh, and all of that goes into our cast house, our foundry, where we alloy and cast into ingots, as I've shown you in the slides. And from there, those ingots get rolled um, into in our rolling mills and our foil plant. Uh, extrusions follow a similar process, but of course they have round bullets instead of big, large, square ingots for flat rolling products. So Uleman sits here at the bottom. This is roughly the boundaries of Uleman. So we've got the scope three of the embedded emissions in our metal coming into the company, coming in from there. Whatever fuel gas we've consumed in that process is our scope one emissions. Whatever electricity we've consumed is our scope two emissions and then scope three from all the other sources that are not embedded in the metal. And calculating and adding all of this up and dividing it and logging it per ingot or per coil or per pack of sheets or per reel of foil, that is uh, what we have to do for, for accurate reporting purposes. So if I continue further then with uh, implications of uh, the, on the practical side, there's, there's basically three. We have to report the greenhouse gas emissions. They will eventually have to get verified. And then eventually we're going to get past uh, 25. We're going to start paying taxes or our importers are going to start paying taxes. And they will, of course, um, want to recover those costs from us. So it will impact on us. So if I just start at the top reporting on greenhouse gas emissions. So currently reporting is done quarter quarterly. Uh, the first two reporting periods were in 2023 quarter four, end of last year, and 2024 quarter one. That we've already completed, and the end of June is fast approaching, so quarter two will be due uh, by the end of July. Currently, reporting is done on scope one and scope two, as well as scope three emissions, which includes those emissions embedded in raw materials that are input to our process, as I've already explained. Scope 3 reporting implies that Uluman has to know the embedded emissions of all significant input materials to our process. The implication of that is that we will in future have to buy and consider in our buying decisions the embedded greenhouse gas emissions of the products that we buy. And this will, of course, drive the impact of the focus on greenhouse gas emissions up the value chain as our customers are pushing it up to us, uh, and we will have to pass it on to all of our suppliers. Secondly, apart from reporting, which is just uh, marking your own homework, really, it has to be verified. And so this is coming. It's not in place yet. I don't know the full extent of it, but the step is in development and verification or auditing of all greenhouse gas emissions reported will have to be prepared sometime during this transition period, which lasts until the end of next year. It is expected to imply the development of verification standards and third-party verification competence or certification. Uh, that's just our interpretation of what's coming. And this obviously implies further costs associated with CBAM implementation in order to get all of these uh, certifications uh, and audits done. 
And then lastly, of course, this is where uh, the the impact will really come to for everybody is the paying of the tax. So the exact pricing of CBAM tax is not yet known. My next slide or so is going to cover this in a in a uh, in more detail. But current estimates are that it is likely to be. 80 to 100 euros, and you've heard the figure of 80 euros being mentioned by one of the earlier presentations already. Uh, the tax on scope one emissions is effective from 1 January 2026. That much we know. Uh, and the important thing also here to, is to understand that scope one means the Uluman scope one, as well as the scope one emissions of all our major suppliers. That is the way that CBAM has defined it in our understanding. The, typing, the timing of the scope two taxes is not yet known. We are awaiting that to be announced. And then um, there was also a question in one of uh, one of the questions uh, in the previous uh, presentations, penalties, if you report wrongly. Indeed, it has already been addressed by the EU. And there are penalties ranging between 10 and 50 euros per ton of unreported embedded emissions that are likely to be levied. And... Um, so that is to be expected. If I then move on, um, this is now where it gets interesting for South Africa specifically, because the rest of the world is all subject to the same conditions. But the European Commission published the following graphs. Um, and once again, I've listed the source there. It's available on their website. And what they have said to the importers of aluminium into the EU is that if you do not have data from your supplier located wherever in the world, then use these values as the default. And what is very interesting to note here is that there's a number of countries listed here, and they have studied uh, the emissions from these countries, and they have published this report. And if you look at the blue dots, which is scope one, or your direct emissions, which in Illumin's case is from our gas consumption, you can see that South Africa the aluminium industry in South Africa that enables us to export, in this case, cold rolled aluminium products, which is exactly what Uluman does, it is in line with global figures. The scope two, however, which is the indirect emissions and is the electricity that we use and, and which contributes to our total carbon footprint, is sitting up here, which is extreme. It is way out if you compare us to the rest of the world. And this is as a result of our grid uh, carbon footprint and our coal-based power. So if you add these two values together, you get a total, which is sitting slightly above 18 tons uh, of CO2 equivalent per ton of aluminium that we produce. Uh, remember this figure because I'm going to come back to it in the following slide. So the importance of this slide is to note how South Africa stands out above any other country in this respect and why our challenges are so intense. So this brings me to the implementation uh, of CBAM and uh, now we will get down to understanding uh, some of this. So if I start, first of all, the proposed implementation of CBAM and the impact it will have is dependent on several variables. and. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm making a few assumptions. The first of all is that South African products exported to the EU are assumed to have that figure of 18 tons of CO2 equivalent per ton of product shipped. Remember the value from the graph that I've shown you just now. This is the value that includes the full scope one, scope two, and scope three as published by the European Commission. I can say that um, our actual emissions, now that we are accurately measuring and reporting it, is lower than this. But I can't disclose the exact values because this is a public presentation. So for the purposes of this presentation, I will just say that that is the ballpark figure. And that is the official published figure to be used by the EU for cases where they do not have a supplier that exactly understands their emissions. The second assumption you have to make if you want to do some sums is what is the tax rate? And I have used the 80 euros per ton of CO2 equivalent for the purposes of this presentation. And then the third uh, um, important variable to note is, will it be on scope one, scope two, or scope three, or all of the above? And what I have worked on is the following implementation graph. This was already also shared 
by one of the previous presenters. But basically, it says that where we are now, until the end of 2025, there is no CBAM tax. CBAM tax will then gradually be introduced at a level of 2.5% in 26, 5% in 27, 10, 22, etc., until we reach 100% implementation by 2034. So there's an implementation curve of the EU CBAM tax. The opposite of that is that at the moment, all importers in the European countries are 100% exempt from paying tax on their imports. Uh, but as, as they start paying tax, of course, that tax-free portion starts reducing to zero. So it's just a mirror image of the bottom graph. It's exactly the same thing. So if I then say that I'm looking at 100% implementation by 2034 on all of the scopes of emissions, that's what I'm going to show you on the next graph, on the next slide, rather. So here it is. Using the assumptions and publicly available information from the previous slide, the CBAM tax has been translated into a percentage of the price of aluminium. So if I take the assumption that aluminium costs 2,200 euro per ton, and it doesn't change until 2034, and the taxes get implemented as per the assumptions of the previous slide, then by 2034, at the 100% at implementation of this tax, the CBAM tax on aluminium products of SA origin would be more than 60% of the value of the unprocessed aluminium. If you look at this figure, it's more than 60%. So I've done this to give an indication of relative to the price of aluminium, which is a very expensive metal. Um, it's got all of the excellent properties of, of infinitely recyclability, et cetera, but it's very expensive to start off with. It's not a cheap metal. Uh, so at 2,200 euros per ton, you're going to add 60% on top of that to cover the CBAM taxes for South African products because they are so energy intensive. So just to show you, um, this is, of course, a worst case scenario. But this worst case scenario, the, how I calculated this, simply to just take you through the steps very quickly. 18 tons of CO2 per product. I already said that our values are less than that, but that's what EU importers have to use if they have nothing better. Assuming a CBAM price of 80 euros per ton, multiplying the two, you get 1,440 euros per ton of product, per ton of aluminium, in other words. And by 2034, when this has been fully taxed on all scopes of supply, it will be roughly 66% of uh, LME. And it will be slowly phased in, as you can see from this graph, which is just a translation of the graph on the previous page. Between 26 and 34, it will be implemented. So that, of course, means that everything stays at easy as it is, and Uleman does nothing about it, and none of our upstream suppliers do anything about it. So my last slide then is, what can we actually do about it and what are we doing about it? So the mitigation measures for the aluminium industry in South Africa and for Uleman specifically is we have to focus on resource efficiency. That will reduce our scope one gas consumption, scope two electricity consumption uh, and their related emissions. And of course, this will be a financial benefit to us in itself, but it will also improve our CBAM taxation values on that. Secondly, the scrap inputs, those scope three reductions that come with the input metals, we have to simply try and push it down to the maximum extent possible by recycling metal, because recycled metal comes into our system with a zero carbon footprint. Uh, so it that makes sense to have maximum recycle recycling content. And um, that is then obviously a, a big focus for us. How can we increase it? On this uh, little graph here, which comes from one of my process slides, you can see virgin aluminium coming in. I've put it in red because it's very intense and scrap from recycling sources is green because it has a zero carbon footprint. But third point, we have to simply focus on getting low carbon intensity energy. Our electricity needs to come from renewable and other low emission sources. And that is the case for the whole aluminium supply chain in South Africa. And it is not something that we can do independent from the national grid. We can play a role, but it's not independent. And then the last three topics here are topics that have already been covered by some of the previous presentations. It's the fact that 
South Africa has a carbon tax. And since CBAM is only levied on the difference what we pay domestically for our carbon tax versus what is levied in the EU for CBAM, we should aim to keep those taxes locally, keep them in the country and make good use of them. Support the decarbonization of the sectors most impacted by CBAM would seem like a good idea to me. Uh, market protection. Um, since the EU is, is levying CBAM taxes, um, everybody else that has an export problem into EU, like South Africa, are going to try and push their products everywhere else. So if we don't protect South Africa, if we don't have a similar carbon border adjustment mechanism for imports into South Africa, the domestic industries like Uleman will be unprotected. And then lastly, advocacy. There was a lot said about this already. What alternatives are there to protectionism and, and taxes and all of these things? Uh, I am not going to expand on that anymore. It's beyond my scope of uh, focus at the moment. And I think the other presenters have already done justice to that. And with that, I say thank you very much. And thanks, Chris. Over to you. Uh, Henrik, that was absolutely fascinating. You, you went on longer than your allocated time, but I just could not cut you because it was so important to hear what you were saying, the practical steps that you have to take to report. And not only that, the practical steps that you have indicated that you are taking in order to, uh, to respond uh, to CBAM, which as actually is its intent. It's intended yes. to get you to respond in various ways, and and you explain those different ways that you actually are responding. So for me, <laughs> as I say, I couldn't catch you because it was just so important. And thank you very much for a very clear, a very well articulated presentation uh, of what it means for a real manufacturer in South Africa uh, that is exporting uh, something like 50% of, of, of its product, uh, a significant amount to the EU, but also to the US and probably other domains that are also looking at uh, CBAM-like um, uh, strategies. So again, thanks for that. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, um, that comes to the end of our presentations. We've had something like 35, 45, 55, 56 questions to date of which uh, 35 have already been responded to by our presenters and 20 questions remain open for response. And these are complex questions. And we are already over time, uh, significantly, well, about 20 minutes over time. Uh, so we're not going to be able to deal with all these questions. It's just, it's just not possible. Uh, but uh, they are documented. And we have responded uh, to uh, 35 of those uh, 55 questions. And I'm going to be sending the remaining questions to all of our presenters and asking them to respond to you by email, because the way the system works is we have the questions, we have the, uh, the we know who's asking the questions, we know we know their contact details, and and so uh, you are going to be responded to. I, I hope by our by our presenters uh, directly. Um, you know, I can't answer these questions myself. Uh, I'm not a specialist in this, and so I'm going to have to call on the help of, of our presenters. But what I thought we would do is instead of answering these text questions, which I say we've got them, we're going to respond to them, is have the opportunity uh, for you uh, uh, to raise your hands uh, and I will um, come to you and you can ask a few questions verbally. We will go uh, on a little bit beyond uh, you know, 4.30, the allocated time, because we have significantly overrun, but we understand understand if people have to leave, uh, they, they, they have to leave. So I'm going to uh, now look at the presenters and ask you to put up your hands if you've got a question to ask. And I see already one question, one hand is up by an old colleague and friend of mine called Clyde Melanson, who's a regular supporter of our webinars and is always asking uh, relevant questions. So uh, Clyde, uh, if you would like to come in here and uh, pose your question to one of the uh, presenters, can I please ask all presenters to switch on your cameras and your mic uh, your microphone when you are going to respond to a question? Clyde, over to you to ask your question. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, lovely, uh, lovely webinar. Hendrik, questions for Hendrik. And I think the answer is quite simple. How useful for you would it be if uh, hillside aluminium smelter were to reduce their scope to emissions to zero within three years? 
would that help your situation at all with your scope two emissions? Because that's quite <laughs> possible. Thanks. <laughs> Yes, so uh, Clyde, thank you for the question, and you are indeed right. It is a very easy question to answer. It would make a massive uh, improvement for us. Yes. Thank you. Uh, whilst I've got you there, um, Hendrik, I just wanted to look, I know this is perhaps a different subject, but uh, we hear about the pending gas cliff, uh, you know, from 2026, June 2026 onwards. And uh, we hear about gas playing a significant role in your heating uh, smelting process. How are you responding to the gas cliff? I mean, I know this is maybe a different question, but maybe it's another way of saying, you know, do you have alternatives, low, low carbon alternatives to smelting uh, other than electricity and gas? Um, as far as alternatives go, I am not aware of anything uh, in use in industry at the moment as an alternative to gas. So obviously there are people that are starting to experiment with mixing hydrogen into their uh, natural gas uh, streams, uh, but that is, I think, some way off. Uh, so with regards to the gas cliff, we are aware of uh, what Sassel has published. We are a member of the Industrial Gas Users Association. And as such, we have a gas committee looking at the risks and trying to find mitigating actions. Uh, which largely come down to, I think, one of the most obvious options is that uh, South Africa has to develop the liquid natural gas importation facilities. Uh, but then there are the other issues about locally developed gas resources uh, that would, of course, uh, hopefully be more cost effective. I'll keep it at that. Thanks for, uh, for that. Uh, yeah, it, it's uh, interesting, you know, exactly what your response is going to be in June 2026. <laughs> it, it must be uh, a huge threat. But that's another that's another issue indeed. Let's move on to Etienne Rubbers. Uh, Etienne, also uh, an old colleague. Uh, Etienne, I'm going to switch on your, uh, allow you to talk. So please ask your question and uh, direct it to one. Please, can you keep these two questions and not standing or, or long statements uh, or opinions, but uh, questions to our presenters, please. Uh, please switch on your microphone, uh, uh, Etienne. Oh, sorry, I've allowed you to talk now. Ah, th thank you. Chris, uh, good good webinar. Thank you very much. I have a question for, for Vincent um, regarding, and I think there's been a lot of chat in the uh, chat box. CBAM, uh, there's two approaches for us to decarbonize as, as a global south. There's carrots in that you can give us cheap financing and concessionary loans, and there's sticks like CBAM. Now, CBAM is essentially a protectionist measure where the EU is trying to protect your local industry because you're taxing CO2 emissions. So essentially, it's 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 maybe a bit prerogative, but it's a it's a bit like slavery or, or colonialism or exploitation of the global south in that we're going to be kept poor because we're going to be penalized for our exports. Thanks. Can you comment on that, uh, Vincente? Of course, I think I have to comment on that. I mean, I, I will try to explain why this is not a protectionist measure. Now, at this moment, before we introduce CBAM or before 2026, when the CBAM will have financial uh, implications or, or consequences, in the EU, how we uh, take into account the carbon risk of the risk of carbon leakage is by giving free allowances to the EU industry. I mentioned before that, for example, in the case of the steel sector, around 80% of their emissions are covered by those free allowances, which means that in practice, only 20% of the nominal carbon price is paid by the EU industry. That's the current situation. And no, there is no CIVA. Now we are introducing CIVA from 2026. As we saw, and thanks to Hendrik, I, I really like his presentation uh, about the details uh, and about the methodology. You can see that the free allowances will be phased out for EU producers, which I can tell you it will be a big impact on the EU producers to reduce also their emissions. And the 80% of the free allowances will be gone, phased out from 2026 to 2034. At the same time, 
the fact that the reality is that now the free allowances have an impact on the carbon price, not only for the goods produced in the EU, but also for the goods exported outside the EU. And I can tell you that if you talk to the EU industry, they are also unhappy sometimes with the introduction of the CBAM, because by introducing CBAM, they will lose this protection with production which is sold in third countries, which is exported to third countries. This, there was a big debate, I can tell you, before 20, between 21 and 2023, when the proposal became, I mean, the proposal from the Commission became, became law. And there was a big discussion about this because the EU industry was complaining they were losing the protection in third markets. So just to say that the introduction of the CIVAM has a big impact, an important impact on the EU industry. So this is why I say, and I think it's very unfair to say that while we are introducing CBAM, we are protecting the EU industry. On the other hand, and forget about exports, okay? Uh, and forget about the introduction or the phase out of the free allowances. On the other hand, what CBAM is doing is just putting the same price on the imported goods into the EU as if they would have been produced in the EU. I mean, you call it a tax. We don't like it calling it tax because it's not a tax. It has been uh, designed in a different way. But if you consider that this is the tax, it would work as like the VAT. So you apply VAT to goods sold in the EU territory, regardless whether they are produced in the EU or so produced in the EU or imported from a third country. CBAM will work in the same way. The same steel sold in the EU territory will pay the same carbon price, either through the ETS or either through the CBAM. So this is not about patronizing. This is not about telling the rest how they have to decarbonize, how fast they have to decarbonize, how, how much or whether they have to introduce a carbon price or not. It's just being fair with the production which is sold in the EU territory. But again, and I want to insist on the first aspect, introducing CBAM, it's a big impact. It's a good, it's a big pressure on the EU producers to decarbonize. Thank you for that uh, clear response, uh, uh, Chente. And uh, I would like to move on to uh, Philippa Rodseth. Uh, Philippa, if you could please switch on your microphone and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, my question is directed to Gaylor. The manufacturing circle has initiated an industry working group um, looking at practical bottom-up uh, responses to current situation um, and and response to to um, monitoring and reporting and and more broadly really how do we address um, these these challenges from an industry perspective? Um, I'm aware that TIPS has also um, been quite proactive in facilitating to industry sessions looking at the metals and and aluminium sectors and would just be interested to the extent that Galo you may be able to comment on on the level of industry participation at, at that point. Um, we've we've also conducted a survey and are sort of uh, growing this initiative together with um, other industry parties, but would just maybe be interested to get your view as to the extent of, of participation from, from various companies that you've you've seen. Thanks, Gaylor. Over to you, Gaylor. Yeah, thanks, Philippa, for, for that. Um... I think what's quite striking is is to yeah. see that um, you know of course much of industry is is uh, yet to be really on top of uh, CBAM regulations. I think of course the awareness over the last few months has uh, increased dramatically, um, which is which is a good thing. Um, but um, really, I think South African industries are largely unprepared. Uh, when it comes to to CBAM, uh, and I must I must say as well, um, channels of communication even for big corporations, you know, from their headquarters to to their subsidiaries, uh, have not been what you would expect of of a big uh, conglomerate. To be to be to be honest, um, but but I think uh, players in industry are catching up, uh, and I think Andrik's presentation is you know speaks to that clearly. Uh, and uh, they are uh, really on top of uh, on top of the issue, and so I think more and more people are, are are getting on top of it. But the issue, as illustrated with Andrew's presentation, then 
comes in with the, around scope free uh, that extends to a lot of, of companies who uh, may not have the systems in place at all. And so certainly um, we need to see government come in uh, to support, particularly with MRV and make sure that we have the right standards and the right systems and keep on the campaign so that uh, people are aware, uh, particularly for, for steel and aluminium, but also for the other sectors that are covered or may yet come um, in in the in future years. Now, thanks for uh, for that. Um, uh, if I uh, I see there's a number of hands up, and I'm going to get to you, Simon, Emily, and Jacques. Uh, but I thought I'd like to just interpose with a question of my own uh, to Henrik. Henrik, uh, you, you know the one of the, the title of this topic is a wake up call to business and industry, and uh, it's clear that Schulman has woken up. There's no no doubt about that from your own presentation. Uh, but you know, I, I try to get a number of banks to come and participate. Uh, in this, and they seem to run a mile. Uh, they seem to be scared to even talk about this topic. And I was wondering whether perhaps they are so exposed, uh, you know, to debt that they've given to, uh, you know, to energy intensive industry uh, that they they haven't quite got their head around the problem or, or their exposure to the problem and what to do about the problem. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you the question. How, what level of awareness do you think there is uh, amongst business? I'm talking about business as opposed to a company like yourselves, uh, finance, financial institutions, banks, uh, and other business. Uh, how, how far have they got their head around the CBAM issue? Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so, Chris, I, I can't assume to understand what the banks are thinking. And in my role, I don't really deal with the banks. Um, that is my colleagues in the finance and treasury department and so on. Uh, but I know that the talks are going on. And uh, when we do engage with our consultants and we do uh, the transitional financial disclosure, risk assessments, etc., we do share that with, with our financiers, etc. Um, so I would think that the banks are, are probably well aware, but uh, the reasons for them not wanting to take on, I can't speculate on. Uh, but as far as the rest of industry go, our upstream suppliers, which we now have to start getting information from, not counting the aluminium industry, the, the, the smelter per se, they are very aware as, as we are. But other industry, generally, there's very little appreciation of why we are asking these questions and what it's all about. Um, it, I think it's the, the, the European export facing companies like ourselves that are mostly aware of this or becoming yeah. aware. Yeah. Uh, Deepak, if I could just move to you and pose a similar question, and that is, okay, awareness is one thing. The question is, how do you respond to it? Like, for example, how does South 32 respond to respond to this? It must be like facing an existential threat. And and, and I, I want to just ask you, Deepak, how, how do you think Eskom is responding? I mean, I'm sure they're aware of it, but we know the big impact that they have uh, you know, as a, a high carbon intensive electricity producer, uh, but but what are they doing to respond to this? Uh, because uh, they are going to play a, have to play a huge role uh, in the response by South Africa. Yeah, and thanks, Chris. I'm not sure I'm best placed to answer for ESCOM. What I can mm -hmm. say is that we welcome the reform that is taking place with respect to the electricity system, as the PCC. If you look at the electricity mix recommendations we made last year, it's clear to us that in order to not respond to CBAM, um, but in order to decarbonize along our own committed pathways, as enunciated in our nationally determined contribution, the mix of renewables onto the grid has to dramatically increase. Having said that, that does help in the sense of that mix increasing in favor of renewables to reduce the deemed average input costs related to industry. Um, let me also just say, I know sh time is short, that while Vicente might make the point that this is fairness, um, I think we must take Gaylo's presentation of how long the journey has been for the EU to come to the point where it in fact could introduce a mechanism like CBAM. And I want to draw the analogy without data. You know, we know who polluted the global good atmosphere of the world over many centuries. And in response to that, there's a requirement that all of us, 
must now be bludgeoned into compliance with respect to a decarbonization intent. As South Africa, I want to say very clearly that we've made our commitment and intentions known very clearly. It's not just rhetoric. As I presented in the slide, the legislative policy and institutional framework that will ensure that we decarbonize has been laid. What CBAM does is unfortunately puts paid to any notion that a country through its own determined industrial and economic policy can undertake this path to net zero commitments that it has made in the multilateral framework. That notwithstanding, we are under no illusion that what the EU CBAM will set into motion are a variety of cacophonic responses across the world, developed and developing country. And what the implications of this degree of chaos is going to result in, we cannot predict. Having said that, my intuitive feel, as I try to indicate, is that we need to walk both paths. On the one hand, we need to submit as a country our protests around unilateral measures in the context of multilateral arrangements and the spirit of multilateral decision making. But secondly, under no illusion that our medium to long term journey to decarbonize our electricity system followed by industry is the path that on a risk assessed basis is in fact the logical way to go. Yeah, interesting uh, what you've said and it was echoed uh, you know, in the other presentations and that, by your presentation is that we have to do what we have to do, CBAM or not. <laughs> we know the path and we've got to follow it. Okay, CBAM is just going to be, uh, I think, in a way, both, and it's, uh, it's not only a stick, it's also a carrot. Uh, and, and we have the competitive advantages uh, in South Africa, uh, and we should focus on our competitive advantages. Anyway, let's quickly move on to Simon Hall. Simon, I'm going to ask you to please keep your question short. I'm sorry for going on myself. Uh, but uh, can you please pose your question? Uh, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you to the presenters. Can you hear me, Chris? Yeah, loud and clear. Thank okay. you. No, good. Thank you. Um, yeah, my question is uh, along the lines, actually, of the uh, carbon-intensive electricity supply in South Africa. And I think Hendrik's presentation was excellent. It was very clear that the biggest problem lies in the scope to emissions ready from the ut current utility. Um, and I just wanted to understand there was a, a range of dates. And my, my question is to Vizente, just to understand um, this phase in of the scope to emissions into CBAM. I think there was a range that obviously between 2026 and 2020, 2034. So that's quite a large range. Is, could, could you maybe give us some more visibility on the timing of when the scope to emissions might be included in CBAM? Yeah, th thanks a lot for this question, because I actually wanted to react to this discussion about ESCOM and electricity production. And I think I want to thank again Hendrik, because he projected a slide which came from the JRC report about the carbon intensity of South African. Uh, I think it was a steel product. I can't remember now which one, but um, where you could see that, for example, in terms of direct emissions, so it's cold warm emissions, South Africa is not so bad. I mean, I would say that in general, you are very good placed even compared with other countries. However, the problem is in particular with the production of electricity. So I think that one of the main problems and where the focus has to be, of course, is on decarbonizing the production of electricity. I can tell you that, for example, the sector which has decarbonized more intensively in the European Union for the last years is precisely electricity. And you know why? Because there were no free allowances for the production of electricity. This is a big difference, for example, with the steel, production, with the aluminum production, with other with other sectors. Now, the question is about scope two emissions or not. For the moment, uh, we only include cement and fertilizers in the scope two. So you only have to calculate indirect emissions from the production of electricity for cement and, and sorry, cement and fertilizers, but not for iron, steel and aluminum. That will come in the future, but that's something we are still analyzing. It has nothing to do with this 26, 2034 timeline that I mentioned before about the free allowances, because that's for the other for the other uh, for the sectors which have free allowances. But in the case of indirect emission, that's something that we are still analyzing. 
Possibly by the end of next year, we will have a better picture of whether we will be extending also to the aluminium and the steel sectors and by when. But honestly, I, I cannot say now because it's too early. We are still analyzing. And of course, they will, this will also depend on other, on other decisions. But if you ask me personally, I think that and it was very clear and evident on the picture. Most of the emissions, for example, in the production of aluminium, I think that around 40% of the, of the emissions in the production of aluminium come from the indirect emissions from the production of electricity. So if we really want to give a strong signal on the aluminium sector to decarbonize, we absolutely need to include also a scope two in the in the uh, sorry a scope two emissions also in the in the scope of the of the CBAM. But no decision yet. I cannot tell you uh, by when the decision will be taken, possibly by the end of next year, and by when they will be they will be introduced. But of course. Power generation, electricity is an important sector. And I think that's where South Africa and other countries have to put the effort in order to decarbonize. And that will help all the other sectors. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to move to Emily Tyler. Uh, Emily, I'm allowing you to talk. Please uh, switch on your mic and ask your question. If you can keep it as short as possible and uh, as direct as possible, Emily. Thank you, Chris, and to all the panelists for a very interesting discussion so far. Um, my question is also speaks into the electricity sector issue and um, into uh, it has been raised a couple of times in the chat, the issue about how the evidence for electricity decarbonization will be will need to be provided. And it, it's a technical point, but I think it's really important in terms of whether what the EU does supports or undermines South Africa's efforts at decarbonizing our electricity supply. Um, supporting, uh, as we reform our electricity sector, supporting market-based solutions, for example, through tradable certificates being valid for evidence um, in terms of a decarbonizing supply rather than direct PPA evidence only, um, really, I, I think, will be um, an important yeah, enabler of, of our um, efforts to decarbonize our electricity supply. So I would, I know as some of the panelists have commented, I'd be very interested in Vicente's uh, views on how these things would be considered um, the, the local context um, perspective on that. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Emily, thank, thank you very much. You. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, Chris. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, Emily, for the question. Yeah, that's that's technical, but I think that's important. Basically, the main rule for assessing the emissions for all sectors will be actual or real emissions. But as I mentioned before, there will also be some default values that will be publishing uh, by the end of 2025. They will be country by country. They will be based on the report of the GRC or on the work of the GRC. So you can already have an orientation of, of those values. But there will be new values, fine-tuned. There will be some sort of markup. But I mean, that, 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 will, that will be half to be analyzed in the future, but in principle it's actual emissions. Electricity is a very specific sector. And I'm talking now about electricity as a seven good. You don't export electricity to the EU, so that's not really relevant to you. Another thing is the indirect emissions that I was mentioned before, I scope to. But electricity as a seven good imported into the EU, for example, imported from Morocco. So in principle, the, the main rule will be the default values. So in that case, uh, it will be the opposite. Because, why? Because uh, all the electricity goes to the grid, all the electricity is imported, we don't know the origin, it's difficult to trace unless you have a smart grid, et cetera, et cetera. So the basic rule will be a default value. And those default values will be based on the CO2 emission factor, which is the, the intensity of the fossil fuel-based electricity. So the worst possible scenario. I understand that in South Africa is most of the electricity because you are still based on coal. But for example, in the EU, I can tell you that most of the electricity is already based on renewables. It depends from one member state to another. I mean, my country, Spain, is quite advanced in renewables. Other countries, not so much advanced. But in general, it's like this. We are analyzing maybe changing the rule and going more through or to a rule, which is the average of the grid that could give also an incentive to introduce more renewables because if you always take the CO2 emission factor, it doesn't take into account the penetration or how quick you are in introducing renewables into your grid. Another thing is indirect emissions, and I think that's more relevant for you. We were talking about indirect emissions, for for example, for the alu uh, aluminium. In that case, normally the, we, we still have to decide. There are different possibilities. One of them, again, would be the CO2 emission factor. So coal. Another one could be the average of the grid. So as long as or as as 
South Africa will be decarbonizing through the introduction of renewables. That will also reduce your average, and that can be also taken into account. Finally, there is the possibility of deviating from the default values and then to be able to use actual emissions also for the production of electricity as a renewable, uh, sorry, as an indirect emission. And you mentioned when there are some conditions, and one of them, of course, is that there is a PPA. So there is a clear, a clear direct link between the production of the electricity and the use of the, of the electricity. If you want, we can discuss about your neighbors, Mozambique, which is also a paradigm. We have been discussing with them. We have been discussing in many fora about the, about the issue. And the question of I'm using electricity, which is from dirty sources, while I'm exporting my clean hydropower electricity to South Africa and I'm getting dirty one from, from ESCOM. So these are the type of things, of course, that we are analyzing, we are trying to see. But my plea, of course, my call to South Africa is please accelerate the decarbonization of the production of electricity. Forget about CBAM, it's not for CBAM. It's for you, it's for the planet, and I think it's good for everyone. Thanks. We're going to take our last question now. And Clyde, I must apologize. It's not going to be you. You've had a question and we are running so over time. I'm going to make the last question, Jacques Balan. Jacques, uh, please switch on your mic. Sorry, here we are. Please switch on your mic. Okay. Sorry, Chris, I've got a rot file in the background going crazy. Um, my question is very specific and it relates to the... Um, the whole uh, renewable energy certificate scenarios um, mm. of which we are now sitting on with the, with, with the advent of um, clean power in South Africa. We're sitting on a lot of those, um, those certificates. Uh, how do we apply them in uh, lowering the carbon footprint? And maybe Hendrik will have some ideas. Uh, you may have looked into that uh, to, to lower those scope two emissions and, and even the scope three emissions that are coming from, from some of his suppliers. I'll go to you, Hendrik. You can switch on your mic. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a, an interesting question. And I, I think uh, Vicente uh, possibly has a better insight into this because he's just spoken about the uncertainty that is around the scope two emissions and uh, the fact that they are working on it. And by the end of next year, hopefully we'll have some indication of what's happening. Uh, but I can say that um, our understanding is that at some point, scope two emissions, which is our electricity consumption, is going to be part of the CBAM taxes. Uh, or uh, Vincente says we shouldn't call them taxes, but the levies uh, for CBAM. And um, then uh, we, we can't generate our solar power on site. We have to get it from an off-site uh, producer. Um, so we are in the process of trying to set up PPAs, uh, and they will have to be multiple ones because after after solar wind becomes uh, possible, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we are uh, working towards the and on the assumption that when the CBAM levies come into place, they will take into account our power purchase agreements of renewable sources that we have entered into. Uh, so if that understanding is not correct, then maybe we should just ask Vincente to correct me. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Henrik. In principle, we don't take into account the green certificates, uh, those green origin or origin certificates. We we have to rely on some of the conditions. The conditions are in our CBAM regulation. One of them is the PPA. Another one is um, um, that there is a um, yeah the, yeah that there is a direct link, of course, from the production of the electricity to the to the consumer of the of the electricity. There has to be a threshold. I can remember now the threshold. Sorry for that. Of the maximum emissions of the of the installation which is uh, producing the renewable electricity, and then there are other conditions which are very technical about uh, making sure that uh, there there is there is uh, an, an assigned capacity uh, which is uh, nominated and explicit and and which can be of course traced. Um, the conditions are in the in the CIMA regulation. You will find them there. But we are not relying on those green certificates uh, because we we know. I'm not saying that you are doing that, but we know the problems with greenwashing and the problems with uh, how those certificates are, are dealt with. But in any case, I mean, if you have suggestions, you have ideas uh, on on these things, uh, we will be happy, of course. For, of reading your your comments or your your suggestions with respect to that, but that's something that has been discussed a lot with our energy experts here in the commission and the climate experts, and and we we had 
doubts about how those certificates are working or how they could be taken into account for scope two emissions. Mm. Interesting. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and Clyde, I'm sorry I can't take your question. We're more than 20 minutes over time, and I have to bring it to an end, and you have had a chance to ask your question. Uh, so I'm going to bring this uh, webinar to an end. I've got lots and lots of more questions. There are lots and lots of questions. Well, actually, I see there's only, uh, well, shall we say, there are still some questions to be answered on the Q&A, 24, in fact. So uh, we're a long way from having answered all the questions, but I've done my best to be over time. Uh, and, and it's been a fascinating discussion for me. I've learned a lot. Uh, I hope you as uh, attendees have also uh, found it uh, useful and, and interesting as I have. Uh, everybody will receive the presentations. Everybody will receive the, the link uh, to view the video on demand. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to firstly thank our presenters for your hard work and participation. I'd like to thank the DTIC, the Re European Union Delegation to South Africa, the Presidential Climate Commission, TIPS, Hewlerman, uh, and the Energy Intensive uh, User Group for your most valued support. Uh, and I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your attendance and participation and interest. And I hope you found it a, a, a useful webinar. Uh, please keep your ears and eyes open for our next webinar. And uh, we will see you then. Farewell. <laughs>